All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, typically, when we say the term hot shop, we refer to uh, a glass studio that has equipment like furnaces and big <laughs> reheating furnaces, and we tend to work glass at a, a bench like this and work the glass off of long steel tubes and, and rods. Uh, we're doing something a little different in the amphitheater hot shop today. We have a, a very special visiting artist working with us. This is Yushin Goins, and uh, he is visiting from Evergreen, Colorado. And Yushin just finished teaching a class at our teaching facility across the parking lot, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. And he is renowned for very fine pattern work. And I'll, I'll walk around with a uh, a finished piece that is pretty close to what he's going to be shooting for with the object he's working on today. He has already been working all through the morning, uh, has about three hours of work already put into this piece, and he's going to be making a pendant. And I'll, I'll come out and join you guys and, and show you the sort of pattern work that we're after here. So this, this style of work, uh, Yushin is very... Uh, notable for doing really fine, detailed, geometric pattern work. And uh, he calls this sort of work filicello. And it actually stems from an Italian technique for furnace-style glass blowing, where uh, we call it reticello, which is what this pattern is here. It looks sort of like a net. And uh, that's, that's where the, the Italian term comes from, from the term net. So uh, to create this sort of crosshatch pattern work at a furnace, you're creating two big blown forms that you stuff one into the other. And if you have the, the pattern going opposite directions on the two pieces when they come together, you get this sort of crosshatched effect. So Yushin is creating that effect through uh, a different method by drawing lines of glass color on the surface of a tube. So I'll continue to walk this around here and show you guys what we're shooting for. So it's incredibly detailed, and the, the spacing and the geometry is really precise. So it is a very time-consuming process to create work of, of this quality and, and this, uh, this sort of accuracy. So he, as I mentioned, he already put in about three hours on the section he's working on now. And it starts as a cylindrical tube. So it starts at a, as a cylindrical tube, and he sort of maps out where each of these lines need to go. And he understands that as he changes the shape of that cylindrical tube, he knows where his different color details are going to wind up in the, the finished shape. So that is what we're shooting for. Yeah, and our, our camera's... You can sort of see he's already established the outlines of where all those, those pattern bits are going to go, and now he's starting to fill in the, the solid color fields in between the lines. So uh, we, we put a mic on you, Sheen, so you can talk with us a little bit. Maybe we'll... I'm here, uh, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me good? Yep, absolutely. Right. Awesome. Nice. So you want to tell us a little bit of the background of how you started to develop work like this, Yushin? Um, in 2008, I, uh, I did this uh, competition up in Vermont called the Pipe Classic. And uh, I was uh, one of the competitors. And Scott Deppie was also a competitor. And he's well known for drawing these, these detailed patterns as well. So I got to watch him do this. And previous to that, I had tried to do this, but not with very much luck because my technique wasn't right. So getting to watch Scott Deppy do this technique changed how I did them all the way around. And uh, then I spent the next years after that just practicing and perfecting them. And I guess I've been doing this technique now for about, I guess, 10 years. I'm going to draw this line of color here. Can't talk while I do it too much. <laughs> and I'm kind of like pressing the color into place after I, after I put it on. It's a very 
delicate process laying these lines. They're very small. The small stringers uh, on this that I drew all morning are about maybe a half a millimeter in diameter or less. Small enough that you could fit them in a mechanical pencil if you wanted to, which I actually know some, some uh, people that do that. Um, guy that goes by Punty, he, he draws a lot of like Mario themed work. And uh, he draws very, very small stringers, 0.4 or something like that of a millimeter. And he uses a mechanical pencil. He loads them all in there and kind of has like five mechanical pencils with the stringers loaded in. And then he draws with them. He gets the ones with the metal tips so that it doesn't melt. So what, is, what are some of the challenges that you're working around? You mentioned how you have to place the color very accurately. What, what could, I, I hate to bring this up, but what could potentially go wrong, and, and what are you doing to avoid that? Um, really, I'm kind of drawing, it's like drawing you know, with a pen and paper, but to be able to draw, I actually have to draw in the flame. So you have a third variable in your drawing process, and finding where the heat is can be very very tricky, you know, I'm drawing out where you can't see the flame anymore, but it's still hot enough to melt the glass because these, these stringers are so thin. So the temperature sort of relates to the flow of your ink. The, the hotter yep. you get that glass, the faster it's flowing. So he's got to sort of find this balance of temperature where he's got the glass flowing at just the right speed to be able to draw at the speed that he wants to draw at. I've got, I've got basically hard ink yeah, mm -hmm. that won't flow unless I put it in the flame. <laughs> so do you draw much with You know, with honestly, I paper? do not draw at all. And I don't draw these patterns on paper before I do them. I just started drawing on the glass. I found it way more, I don't know, engaging for me. I never really got into drawing on paper too much. As the years have progressed, I've started to draw designs a little bit on paper, but not the not these patterns. I don't draw these on paper, but I draw like you know different blown forms. I'll draw the shapes out beforehand uh, just to kind of get you know the concept out and try and figure out exactly how I want to shape something. But that's with hollow shaping. With this, I don't draw these out. I do all of my experimenting on the glass. If I draw one and I don't like it, I throw it away which it, you don't want to do that, but sometimes you do. Yep. <laughs> if you're going to make quality work uh, as you're experimenting, not all those experiments work out to your taste and your, your quality level. You don't want to be putting out second quality work with your name attached to it. So to, to get to a, a level of uh, respect in the industry that Yushin has earned, uh, he does not put any work out there that isn't of the, the utmost quality. And that, uh, that quality starts from the very beginning of the process. Even just creating these little stringers that he's drawing with, the, the colored glass he starts with are these rods of solid colored glass. So he'd heat up the rod, and if you pull, it stretches and it gets thinner. But a concern you can have when you're heating up uh, a rod of glass is you can introduce air bubbles. Uh, a lot of these colored glasses, there are already some very fine air bubbles inside of the glass, and as you heat the glass, they will swell and expand. And then as he pulls the stringer, you could get a bunch of air bubbles trapped in that stringer. And he would see results of that in the finished piece. Uh, anywhere there's an air bubble, you're going to have a thinner layer of color. It may even pop, so you don't have any color coverage in a certain spot. So even just pulling the, the little threads that he's drawing with, he had to be very precise in heating these rods and pushing any potential air bubbles out to the sides away from the material that he actually ends up using. So he uh, probably the, the first hour or so today, he was just pulling these little thin threads, getting them just the right thicknesses that he needs, uh, making sure to avoid any, any problem areas, any of that bubbling. And uh, this, this piece, uh, I mentioned, he's already put three hours into it. And we've got him scheduled to work until 4. And that may be enough time to get this completely finished. But to do this level of work, uh, typically our, our demonstrations here at the museum, we try to keep them 
uh, between about 15 to maybe 25 minutes, and typically we'll make uh, you know, a, a pretty full-size standard vase or bowl. But uh, with Yushin here, we have a unique opportunity to really see much more complex work and really see the, the full scale of the process involved to, to make this level of work. So uh, if uh, you find that you're, you're, you're sort of overwhelming yourself with some of this, I would suggest watching for a while. You get a good feel of what he's up to in this stage of the process. Maybe check out a, a few other galleries and come on back and see the, the next steps as he progresses. Because it's uh, an, an awful lot of detail and many very precise steps to pull off uh, the, the quality of work that he's shooting for here. And if you guys do have any questions at all, shout them out, throw your hand up in the air. We'll, we'll get your questions answered. And I'll, I'll sort of continue to give you some glassy information. And as Yushin gets to some points that he wants to point out to you guys, he'll, he'll speak up as well. And we are live streaming uh, this work as well, both on the museum's YouTube channel and also on uh, Torch Talk YouTube channel. Oh. We have a, a question so from our live stream as to what torch Yushin is using. This is a Herbert Arnold 40 mil uh, Zenit burner. And I prefer this torch for this technique just because I can, I can go from a large heating flame like this where I can reheat down to a small flame very quickly. On top of that, I can also, um, just the flame characteristics of this small flame are really good for drawing with stringers. And it doesn't harm the torch. Um, some other torches can get damage done to them by running a small flame a lot, like all the time. Mm -hmm. So this torch holds up really well for the small flame. Yeah, so they're even within flame working, which is uh, just one facet of the, the glass making industry, there are a lot of different torches available on the market. And they have different characteristics. And you have to think about the style of work you want to make. And you match up the right tool for the job that you need to do. And here Yushin's trying to draw very accurately with really thin pieces of glass. He needs a torch that can put out a very fine needle to be able to control those, those thin stringers the way he wants to. And as he mentioned, he likes having that, uh, that variability where he can go from this tiny, super hot little needle flame out to a much bigger flame really quickly. And uh, do you find that the flame characteristics are particularly nice to colored glass also? Is that a, a benefit of this torch? Well, be just because of how this torch uh, runs it runs a very low gas pressure, so the, the propane coming into this torch is somewhere between one, I think it's less than one PSI, actually. Mm -hmm. But how they've designed the torch is that it has a high volume but a low pressure. So this, this flame is really soft, which is really good for pattern drawing and stuff mm -hmm. with small stringers. Some other torches run much higher uh, propane pressures. Like a GTT, for instance, runs, I think, at 10 PSI, which is 10 times more pressure. Um, and you really feel that when you're trying to draw your stringers, because it'll start pushing stuff around and uh, melting stuff in faster than you want to. Um, I want to keep these lines raised on the outside until I've gotten all of them on. And then I melt them all in at the end, which I'll probably be there and maybe in you know, I'd say two hours from now, I'm probably going to be at a point where I'm going to be melting in these stringers. And then I'm going to do the, uh, the flip process, where I, I terminate the end and then flip it open. And then you can see the actual pattern I've been drawing this whole time. Because right now, this is just all on the outside of the tube. And you can kind of see it, but the inside is the, is the side that you end up viewing from the front. So sometimes I kind of peek in into the inside from, from the bottom here. I can kind of look into the tube and see what's going on. Is that the seven hole center fire? Yeah, this is the, the seven, seven port center. I prefer that to the single port, but everyone's different. Um, mm -hmm. Herbert Arnold does make a, uh, it's kind of like a Carlisle center, but smaller. Very similar though. Gotcha. What mixture of gases are we running on? We've got propane and oxygen. Propane and oxygen. And there is an air inlet here, but I don't have it connected right now. Uh, 
but the air is really nice for um, even making your flame a little cooler if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't usually run air while I'm drawing stringers, but I know some people who do. I've, I've worked on one of these torches a little bit, and uh, I've definitely noticed they really soak the glass with heat. Uh, as Yushin was mentioning, there are some torches that have a lot of thrust of the gases, and the tendency there is you heat one spot on the, the tube, you're turning the tube, and you've got one spot that's a little hotter than the rest. It's how, hard to get a very even temperature all around the tube. With this particular torch and the way it gently pushes that flame at the glass, it seems to really soak the heat through the glass more uniformly. That's, that's sort of been my experience with these. It's just a, a nice, gentle flame. It's not forcing the glass around at all. The, the heat has a chance to really soak into the glass. And uh, as, you, as you work with the material this, this intimately, if every little factor, every little bit of your tooling and your, your colored glass, your gas pressures, your body position, your hand positions, everything matters. Oh, more questions from the live stream? What do we got? Do you ever do solid work on the Zenit, or do you just prefer it for hollow Oh, definitely. Hollow work? Um, it's a great torch for making marbles. Um, and I've, I actually spent quite a few years making marbles. Um, 2011 to 2013, I made mostly marbles, mm -hmm. more than any other object. And um, this torch was what I was working on most of the time. Unless the marble got to a bigger size, then I would go to the GTT torch just because it has a little more heat. Mm -hmm. Nice. The, the internet is active today. <laughs> Live stream is firing away. <coughs> and if you guys have any questions as well, don't uh, don't hesitate to to fire away. We will get them answered. So we'll let, oh, we've got a question over here. What do you got? Gotcha. So we have a, a question here, Yush. Uh, sure. As you're drawing and filling in with the color and going over your sort of the, the white lines and the, the dark lines there, how do you manage to avoid trapping air bubbles as you sort of cross over those index lines? Uh, that is a good question. I usually melt in the lines just a little bit so that when I'm going over a previous line, it's still raised a little bit, but there's not an actual like crease there that could catch air. So as I'm laying over that, it won't catch air. <laughs> Hopefully. I yeah. still catch a little bit of bubbles every once in a while, but I try not to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I do make my living from glass blowing. That is all I do. Literally all I do. No. <laughs> uh, the yellow is, I believe, just yellow uh, canary, I think, from from North Star, and then this I think is goldenrod. They're pretty close to the same, but one's a little darker. I 
Sure. Do you prefer the Mozart pads or the newer glass alchemy pads for this process that are a little more watered down or whatever? Uh, because of the reformulation with the, with the alchemy ones, they kind of thinned them out a little bit. I prefer more opaque, so right now North Star is the way to go for me. Yep. Do you change your flame chemistry dependent on the colors you're using or for a process like this, are you pretty much keeping to the, the same flame chemistry? I don't really, when you pull the colors down to this small stringer size, you don't really have to worry about flame characteristics very much anymore. Um, if there is a color that reacts uh, to a small flame and even in the small stringer form, I just don't use that color. <laughs> gotcha. Yep. Uh, so what we're talking about with how the glass responds to flame chemistry. Well, flame chemistry refers to the balance of oxygen to propane that he's got mixed in his flame. Certain glasses react differently to different mixtures of the gas and oxygen. So uh, a color like this yellow, if he's using a, a thicker piece of it, and uh, using a flame that has too much oxygen or not enough oxygen in it, it may start to boil and bubble. And we, we run into issues where we get a, a poor quality bit of color to try to draw this pattern work with. Uh, and as Eugene was saying, when you get things down to this scale where they're really thin stringers, there's less opportunity for the glass to, to react differently uh, with the, the mixture of gases in the flame. And there are even colors in this palette that we can change the color dependent on the mixtures of gas and oxygen and the, the different temperature ranges we keep the glass at. So there's a, a lot of factors in how we set a, a proper flame. What is your favorite color combination or pattern? Hmm, that is a good question. <laughs> I've done so many different patterns and so many different color combinations. Lately, I've been going for more of like the rainbow ones, mm -hmm. just because I like the full range of color. Oh. Whoa, water is dripping. Uh oh. <laughs> right on me. <laughs> that just surprised me. I think it was probably just like a. You're not the maybe only it's one warming up by outside. That. <laughs> <laughs> the snow's melting. All right, we will keep our eyes peeled for another drop, and if you get one more drop, we're going to move Whoa. you further <laughs> forward or something. <laughs> you just did get, get one? me right on my piece. Uh, well, on my hand, anyways. Let's uh, maybe we slide may you have to a move foot over forward. A tad. Yeah, let's pull you forward a little bit here. I would say go that way a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then just you'll be make fine. sure the hoses come with us. It's not doing it anymore, though. It's just like once. Oh, yeah. okay. Never mind. It did land. It, it's right where my hand is, too. <laughs> let's, let's pull you <laughs> over then a little bit. Okay, okay. Will, can you slide with me? We'll watch the hoses. Are those hoses still slacked under you there? Uh, in addition to being annoying to have uh, whatever random water that it, if we're assuming it's water dripping on him. Uh, aside from just the annoyance of it, it could risk the piece. So if the, the glass is just the right temperature and it gets cooled really quickly by a drop of water, it will crack. So uh, not only do we want Yushin to be really comfortable, we also want the glass to stay comfortable. Yep, yep. <laughs> Although I have dropped um, pieces right into the water bucket accidentally. <laughs> uh, remember, I was actually drawing one of these and I finished the whole drawing and I was doing the flipping process and I had a punty on the front and I was cutting some glass off with the shears over the water bucket and boom, the whole thing went right into the water and it made this, you know, the sound that glass makes when it goes into a water bucket. <laughs> I reached in immediately and grabbed it out with my tweezers and there was only one other little piece that had broken off of it. I put it in the kiln, put the little piece in the kiln and then I brought them out and I actually married them back together <laughs> without any trace. It was very lucky, but that's just, uh, I guess, a short lesson on how to react when something like that goes wrong. You know, a lot of times people would give up and just go, well, it's in the water bucket, that's it. 
and they just let it crumble the rest of the way. Instead, I reacted really quickly, and I took it out and put it in the kiln. Nice. Fixed it, but mm -hmm. yeah. That's uh, amazing. When things go wrong, if you have the ability to think clearly when they first go wrong and sort of think about what the material needs, what just happened to it, how you can straighten out what it needs, it's uh, amazing what you can save. That was definitely a lesson I've learned uh, a long time ago, watching uh, an artist, Jim Novak, working in the, the hot shop, and he had a, a huge female torso on the end of a blowpipe and was just about done working on this amazing piece, and there are probably 100 people watching, and all of a sudden the piece falls off the pipe, hits the floor, and the only person who wasn't freaking out out of 110 people was the artist. He very calmly looked down at it, looked at his assistant, asked for a couple of things. He grabbed a, a set of Kevlar gloves, warmed them up, picked them up. His assistant was ready with another punty to reattach it, and they managed to finish the piece. It, it had some blemishes to it. It wasn't a first quality piece after that, but the, the key is to really just pause for a second and think clearly, think about what the material needs, and it's, a, it's amazing what you can save. It's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. Yep. But I also feel like uh, glass blowing in general is sort of like a process of uh, constantly seeing what your, uh, your minor little flaws are, your little mistakes as you're making it, and you're correcting. It's like every movement is a correction to make it better. And I've always felt that way. I don't know. It's kind of how life is, too. <laughs> Okay, so now I've got yellow and orange. This is a really light orange. But I do have yellow and orange on there. And I'm gonna do red next. So I'm kind of doing a fire fade on these X's that are going around the edge here. Kind of see it on the monitors. And as Yushin is uh, mentioning what colors are on there, they might look a little different right now. Uh, when colored glass is hot, it often looks a bit different than it will when it's completely cooled down. And you'll, you'll notice that as he's working as well. He might pick up a stringer that looks yellow when he picks it up, but as he's working, it's a really bright glowing orange. And then as it cools, it loses that glow from the heat, but it still looks orangey. As it cools completely, it comes all the way back to yellow. So just different temperatures, different colored glasses have a, a different appearance. Yeah, the cadmium in, this, uh, in these red, yellows, and oranges is actually what changes color while it's hot. And um, it's kind of a good indicator for boro in general, just because when the color starts to go back to normal, that means that's time for me to reheat. And it's, kind of a, it's a great indicator because it keeps your piece from cracking. If this gets too cold, it will just they, it happens sometimes. I'll have little cracks happen. I can usually fix them and then continue working. So uh, another question off the, the interwebs there. People wondering with the flip process, the, the disc flip, do you find it easier on thicker wall tubing or thinner wall? Uh, it's much easier on thicker wall tubing. This is heavy wall right here. Um, I have better luck drawing these pendant sized patterns on, on heavy wall. But uh, I think this is probably three millimeters in thickness. Mm -hmm. That's pretty average for what I like to draw on for the smaller patterns. But I stay with that three millimeter thickness all the way up to the larger size tubing. Like I've drawn on up to 40 millimeters. And on 40 millimeter tubing, it would still be three millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. I think that would technically be called medium wall. So. It's just a larger diameter tube, but it looks thinner. It's just, just a larger diameter tube. So when you first started doing these filicello patterns, did you start on simpler patterns than what you've got going here, or did you dive right into this level of complexity? I definitely did simpler, much, much simpler. Mm -hmm. When I first started, I would kind of just do six lines diagonal 
and then six lines back the other the other way yep. and create you know 16 it was just 16 lines really simple and I would fill each panel in with uh, with one color I wouldn't be doing all this extra you know black and white you know mm -hmm. crisscrossing and stuff so I mentioned the flip technique or disk flip. Well, ultimately, uh, you see Yushin's drawing on a cylinder of glass. So he's got to take this shape and ultimately wind up with a disk shape. And as he's drawing his pattern on the outside of the tube, what ultimately becomes the face of the design is on the inside of the tube. So he's got to take that cylinder shape, and uh, once he's got the pattern all set up, he's going to reform it and open the inside, flip it open, so then what becomes the face of the pendant is from the inside of the tube. And by doing that, he's protected his color pattern, and also he gets a nice layer of clear over the tops of uh, the color. So it magnifies it, it gives it a little more of a, a glossy, glassy sort of look. So many more steps to go once, uh, once the pattern is all laid on there. And then as he's doing all that shaping of getting from a, a cylinder to the disc, he's got to make sure he's not shifting that whole pattern as he's changing the shape of the glass. So there's a, a lot of very exacting steps involved to, to get to the, the proper finished object that he's after. People often ask us, is it easier to make something that's really big or make something that's really small? Well, there's sort of a, a middle ground that's really the easiest. And as you get smaller in detail, it takes more precision. As you get larger in scale, it may take more people and more strength to, to deal with an object. And uh, this is at that level of small scale where you can see the sort of precision it takes in his hands. We were, talked earlier about uh, his breathing as he's laying down these lines. Uh, he's always certain to inhale just before starting the line and exhaling through it to keep his hands nice and steady, keep his body in rhythm with what he's doing. And uh, I've noticed there's a tendency when you're working very precisely and you're a little tense and, and you know, placing things really precisely, you don't breathe in the same rhythm. You sort of lock up a little bit. Maybe you pause your breath for a few seconds, and that throws you off. It throws off your body rhythm. It throws off your, your energy. You're not oxygenating your blood at the same rate. And that may start to get your hands shaking. You may get more fatigued more easily. So at this, this level of what's going on here, even his breathing pattern is, is really an important aspect of, of making this sort of work. So there's uh, an awful lot to be considered here. Some watchmakers have to uh, um, actually place certain certain things in between heartbeats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not to that degree, so. Right. <laughs> oh boy, we'll connect you to an EKG machine uh, when you come back in a few years. Surge and surgeons see. have things that help them steady their hands more too. Sure. Um, if we want to get much more detailed than what level uh, glass is currently at, we'll probably have to get some of that equipment. <laughs> Here's one for you. <laughs> if you could dream up a new glass tool, what would it be? And, uh, what sort of work would it do for you? Wow, that is a great question. <laughs> um, the tool makers are really doing a good job now of you know, meeting our demands of what we need. Um, recently, I've started doing a lot of faceting, like cutting, uh, cold working on my pendants mm -hmm. and uh, some other parts of some of the pieces I make. And uh, this new faceter I got was made by Ultratech, which is a gemstone company. They make they make faceters designed to cut gemstones, but now they made a faceter designed to work with glass. It's designed only for glass, mm -hmm. 
and they started a new company called Glass Tech to um, sell those new, those new machines. And I bought one of them, and it had a whole bunch of things that made it a little bit easier to use mm -hmm. for, a, for a glass maker as opposed to someone working with gemstones. So a lot of that is happening in tool world in glass, and um, tools are, it seems like a new tool is getting made every day almost. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so far, so good, but I mean, like I said, if, if we want to get much more detailed with these stringers, we might have to develop some kind of something to make that happen, um, whether it be wearing uh, maybe some magnifying glasses or mm -hmm. something like that that like surgeons wear when they're doing like highly detailed work. Or I don't know, maybe uh, maybe a more precise flame, mm -hmm. something that's even sharper, or something I don't know. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. We'll see where it goes. But I know that um, the detail level I'm at now is I'm not even the top of the food chain as far as detail level goes. There's other guys doing smaller stringers. Um, actually, a young fellow in one of my <laughs> classes who was. Doing Any, the smallest the stringers I've ever seen. He's here, <laughs> actually. He's right here in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> this guy. Yeah, he goes by Frompy Glass on uh, Frompy on Instagram. If you guys want to see his his detail, but he makes uh, one of these patterns, but eight millimeters in diameter. So, imagine the size stringer. He said that his beard hair is thicker than the stringer that he uses. <laughs> that gives you an idea. 0.06 millimeters. So I'm using 0.05, or I'm, I'm, I'm using 0.5. He's using 0.06. So 10 times smaller stringer to make these little teeny, teeny little patterns. You have to pretty much take out a magnifying glass to look at. Pretty fantastic. Hopefully, we'll get to do a collaboration in the future. Yes, yes. Yeah, one of the pendants that he made, he made a, a filicello pendant. And then the bale itself, he made a little mini filicello that was a part of the bale for the loop on the top. And it was a, I thought it was a milli. And then I looked closer, and I was like, oh my gosh, he drew those. That's do you, detail. Do you have one on you? <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see if the camera can pick up both of them next to each other. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> my eyes don't work well enough to even consider this kind of work, let alone what my hands would do or not. A lot of practice. I bet. Yeah, you're going to need a magnifying glass. <laughs> uh, it's insane. Let's see what the camera can pick up. If, uh, yeah, Let's there see. you go. <laughs> Let's see the scale difference. It is literally the size you, of a uh, of a milli chip. Can we pick these up down here? Yeah, yeah, maybe get in there. <laughs> see if you can get it. I don't know. Maybe if I hold it up a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll walk this around. Yeah, I, I can't even hold it steady enough for the camera. So we'll do another little lap around here and show you guys what we got. Hand drawn with stringers. <laughs> oh my uh, I'll, I'll walk them around. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, my, my hands are sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's crazy is that pattern, that little teeny eight millimeter disc that he made takes the to same amount of time, or maybe there. a little bit less, than what I'm drawing right now. So just because it's smaller doesn't mean it takes less time. It takes, maybe even takes more time, because he's drawing less lines. Uh, pretty crazy. <laughs> you guys have seen these, right? It's interesting. Even with uh, using the same technique, it's still a different body of work and a different voice that comes through on the, on these objects. Pretty wild. <laughs> 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 so, 
So if you want to see his work, it's uh, it's from P on Instagram, from P. Check that out. It's it's really amazing stuff. Hopefully, uh, Yushin, we've got requests for you to come back. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> Yep, your, your class sold out, I, so we're going to need you to come, come back, back as I'm, soon I'm as sure possible. I'm sure I'll be back, definitely. I did hear there were 30 people on the wait list. Um, I was flattered. I was, I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> that's what I was thinking, yep. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God, is the proper comment. Little thin lines of glass on there. Mm -hmm. Oop, get you in the light there. Pretty wild. Glassmakers are really pushing the envelope of what we can do these days. It is amazing. This is one of his works. Correct. So I think he draws his lines on six millimeter tubing. So I'm using 19 millimeter tubing. It's, it's really, he has to hand make it maybe. Do you hand, he buys six mil tubing and then he draws on that. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> quite impressive. Wild. Thanks bud. Mm -hmm. It is the kind of thing that you have to show someone. I mean, you can't really get a photo of it unless you did Maybe a macro lens you could get you get some good photos. Yeah, I'd be curious to connect you with our photographers here at the museum and see what they go through to try to shoot something like that. That'd be interesting. Yeah. And you did that one in the class, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Can even perform at that level in an away game, huh? Not bad. <laughs> it's interesting. You, you get used to your own studio, your own comfort zone that you've set up, and then you, you go to a, a place like this where we sort of stick you in the middle of a floor with some random table or go to our, our studio classroom, which is fantastic, but it's not set up the same way your home studio is, and it's not, not always so easy to, to make that, that same quality of meal when you're in somebody else's kitchen. And uh, it's, it's similar with, uh, with glass working. It, it takes a little bit to adapt to your surroundings. But uh, a sign of true mastery is really being able to make the same quality of work no matter where you are, whatever sort of tools people handle or hand you. So I'm trying to decide what, how I'm going to color the rest of this pattern. I just finished the red. So I've got yellow, orange, and red. And I did plan on using this lapis color. It's like a lapis blue. It's kind of between blue and purple. It's a really nice color, though. So I was going to do highlights of that. I think that's all I had pulled, but I might want to add some green in. That would give it more of a rainbow look. No, no pressure on this question, but what, what was your favorite thing about teaching in Corning all week? Um, just the uh, the students. They were very enthu enthusiastic and stoked to be there, and they put their really good energy all the way around. And then also having Corning. I mean, having this, you know, the museum right here, being able to go on these tours. Mm -hmm. I got to go on a tour uh, to this. Uh, um, they make like dinnerware. It was really amazing it was <laughs> they make like plates and bowls and it's out of the special glass that they developed there and they gave us a bowl after after the tour as well and it was just crazy to see this huge furnace they had this furnace that was if you can go on the tour I highly suggest it but I don't know how often they do it 
But yeah, it was incredible. This furnace was probably 20 feet across and it has this big thing that's putting material in at all times. It's being dropped into the furnace and then um, glass is coming out the bottom and it's getting shaped into a ribbon and then the ribbon's getting stamped into bowls and plates and then they're going along conveyors and then they come down to an inspection area. People are looking at them. It's incredible. So that was, that was a really cool tour. Among other tours, um, the Science Museum, I got to go in there, uh, all that stuff. And then, yeah, just all of the, uh, the talks and stuff. There was a lot of great lectures that I did catch a couple of. Nice. Uh, Jane Cook's lecture was really good about, it was like about glass chemistry and science. Mm -hmm. That I learned so much in that. Um, just all of these ideas that I kind of thought about, but I didn't know the science behind them. And then hearing her talk about it was incredible. Yeah. yeah I've been, I'm fortunate. I work here. I get to work with Jane all the time. And I, I've learned a ton since she joined our staff. Super smart person, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a chief scientist <coughs> here at the Corning Museum of Glass who uh, came from working for Corning Incorporated for a number of years as a, a, a high level scientist for them as well. And as glass artists, it's really important to understand the, the material we work with as thoroughly as possible to get the best possible results out of it. And uh, even though it takes a, a lifetime of study and a very focused field of science to, to really become an expert on the material, just uh, getting some, some little tidbits about why certain things are happening that we notice with the material and, and getting that true scientific background on what's really happening on the atomic level with the material will change your perspective and, and really change how you handle the material. You, you start to understand how to use the material more effectively. And uh, glass is a, it's a really really intense material. There's a, there's a lot to know about it. It's almost like you're working with a, a living organism and you have to sort of form this relationship with the material as, as Yushin is heating and pushing and pulling and placing material. He's, he's sort of interacting with this changing material the whole time. It, it changes dependent on temperature. It changes with the amount of time you keep it at a certain temperature. So you really uh, you, you develop a very intimate feel with the material over the years, and uh, it, it makes a huge difference in your finished work how you how you build that relationship with the material. And uh, Jeff's pieces, if you're wondering, or we're not going to bother answering that question. <laughs> we'll answer it for you tomorrow. I think I decided on a I decided on a pattern or a way to lay the uh, the rest of this out. It's going to take a little bit, but it's it'll look really nice because now I have to fill each one of these little teeny diamonds in with with color, and it's just tedious. Not quite as tedious as drawing the lines, though. Drawing the lines is takes you know. I guess I spent an hour pulling stringers and two hours drawing just the, the black and the white lines. So I'm kind of heating the glass up, getting it up to temperature, and then I'm pushing it into these little spaces. You have to actually push it in there. If you don't push it in enough, it can um, trap air bubbles or you can have other problems, mostly the air bubble problem. It's the main one, but. Yeah, there are certain objects and certain patterns where we, we might intentionally put some air bubbles in, but uh, for what Yushin's shooting for here, that is really not what we're looking for. We want that color to be nice and clean and no, no disturbances in the pattern.
It's like the meditation zone in here today. <laughs> Seems like a good environment for this work. Yeah, that hum of the furnace really does help, actually. <laughs> nice. I don't even need music. Mm -hmm. this, is, and this is one of the quietest glass shops you will ever walk into, and especially for the scale of it, for our, our massive furnaces and the amount of ventilation we have going on here. It's uh, pretty comfortable and quiet. So for those of you who are, are just now joining us, uh, welcome to the Amphitheater Hot Shop. And uh, typically in a hot shop, uh, we are referring to equipment like the big furnaces that you see back here against the wall. Well, today and tomorrow we have a, a bit of a special program going on. We are very fortunate to have a, a very talented artist joining us. This is Yushin Goines, and uh, he's visiting from Colorado. He spent uh, this past week teaching a class at our teaching facility across the parking lot, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. And uh, we've got him for a couple of days in the amphitheater here to demonstrate his work and uh, show us all the, uh, all the efforts that, that go into making the objects that, that he focuses on. And he is working on a, a highly detailed pendant. And he's been working on this same object since 9 this morning. Uh, we were nice enough to give him a few minutes to eat some lunch. And then he's been digging right back into the same piece again and uh, making extremely detailed pattern work that uh, really takes a full day of work to finish an object this size. And uh, we'll, we'll walk up there and I'll show you guys the, the pattern that we're shooting for here. And typically, our, our demonstrations here at the museum, we, uh, we tend to keep them to maybe 15 to 25 minutes or so. But uh, it's nice to take an opportunity to really show the full scope of what goes into a more complex object. So we can show you with a, a, a little more accuracy the, how complex glass can be. Yeah, and it's really not about scale. Uh, larger objects could take more time, but oftentimes smaller, more detailed objects take uh, a whole lot of time. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to, to really show you guys the, the full extent of what goes into to making the, the highest level of, of glasswork. Ah, okay, another, another good question for you, Yush. All right. Uh, how do you keep those temperamental cadmium colors from boiling as you're drawing with stringers? Well, that is a good question. Um, it starts with the pulling process. I use a really soft flame, really soft heat, and I do a what's called a bubble-free stringer technique, which I did not explain when I was pulling stringers this morning, but it basically consists of nipping a small piece of color off the end of a rod, and then you punny up to it, and you melt it from the punty side to the other end slowly, and it melts the air out of, out of the rod, and then you pull that into a stringer. And you end up with a small stringer, but it's, it's good enough size, you know, a nice stringer without air bubbles. And so, you know, they are boily even without air bubbles, the, the cadmium colors. But uh, if you take the air out, it does make them a little bit uh, more friendly to work with. So I do that. And then um, when I'm drawing the lines, the, the flame is so soft and small that it doesn't generally cause any bubbling. But sometimes it does. Like sometimes I'll put uh, you know, a red crayon or yeah, a cadmium color into the, into the flame, and I'll see it boil up a little bit. I'll just go ahead and nip that off the end and start with a fresh tip to start over again. 
Uh, if you use too hot of a flame, they will boil. So you do have to be really, it's a super small, super soft flame, very gentle. You just want to get the glass hot enough to push into place. You don't want to get it too hot. So it's kind of hard to do with the small flame, though. Honestly, the, f the small flame treats the cadmium colors really well. Uh, so your your prevention of boiling starts from the very beginning of process. Straight, exactly. Straight from pulling the stringer right through applying the stringer. Exactly, yeah. So we had a, another question come in off the, the interwebs. Somebody wondering what it would cost to set up a, a flame working setup. And uh, I'll, I'll sort of dive into that one. Uh, it really depends on the level of equipment you're looking for, but setting up a, a flame working studio is probably one of the least expensive ways to get set up and work with molten glass. Uh, you can get a torch for as cheap as oh, a little over a hundred bucks, or you could spend a few thousand on a torch. Uh, you would certainly need uh, some regulators, some gas lines. You would want an annealing oven that's going to cost you anywhere from maybe $500 to a few thousand, depending on the, the size and precision you need from that oven. So uh, you really can get set up and, and get flame working for anywhere from about $1,000 to a, a few thousand dollars. It's a, a pretty accessible form of, of working glass. Now to set up furnaces and, and things like what we've got going here, people often look at the price tag on the front end. When you buy a furnace, it may cost you $25,000, $30,000, and that's just the beginning of the expense. Once you light that furnace, you've got to keep it on. And uh, our, our furnace, even though we're not even going to pull any glass out of there for the next day or so, we're going to keep it on the whole time and keep that glass molten because if we cool it down, uh, we risk starting to crack some of the bricks of the furnace if they cool too quickly. Or if we need to heat it back up, it takes a few days to warm the whole furnace back up properly. So it's actually more efficient and safer for us just to leave the furnace on. So uh, once you get that furnace going, it's a constant expense. One of the benefits to the torch, when you shut that torch off, you're not, not, not spending any money on gases anymore. So there's uh, another financial advantage there. So question, do the stringers melt at a lower temperature than the tube? And uh, all this glass has pretty much the same melting temperature, but because the stringer is thinner, it heats up faster than the tube. It would take uh, more BTUs to push heat through that whole tube and really get it soft and moving, as opposed to the stringer being so thin, the heat penetrates it faster. But as far as melting temperatures, they're about the same. So for those of you who aren't aware, we're, we're live streaming this on the web also. So we've got questions coming in from internet land and whatever questions you guys have, uh, don't hesitate to fire away. We'll, we'll get them all worked out. And uh, if you are looking for maybe a different style of demo, uh, typically in here we're doing hot glass, furnace glass blowing, things like these bowls and vases that you see along the, the front of the stage here. Uh, we are still doing demos like these today in our innovation hot shop, so right above the admissions lobby. Uh, if you are interested in seeing a 20-minute demo of a, a fairly standard bowl or vase, you can be sure to catch those up there. Uh, we have demonstrations on flame working up in the innovation center as well. We have uh, a demonstration on fiber optics and how that technology works and uh, also a, a demo on glass breaking where we sort of talk about how and why glass breaks the way it does and how we can affect that with, uh, with different scientific approaches on the glass. So all sorts of stuff to see and do here. How does Yushin not go crazy when he's working on this level of detail all the time? Seems like that's your meditative space yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, this, it is. It's, is like, it's like a meditation. I mean, that's how you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I do have to be in the right mindset to do this kind of work. Sometimes I just don't feel like it. I'll sit down to draw one of these, and I just won't be in the right mind state. 
I guess uh, the more you do them, the more you can get into that zone and, and draw with small stringers. Um, but I find that it does take a couple of patterns before you're really in the zone. Uh, the first one is always going to be rusty, and you're going to have some lines that go the wrong way. Next one gets a little bit better and a little bit better, and so on. So I, I think once you're in drawing mode, you kinda, you, you, you're going to want to stay there, or maybe not. Maybe you're going to be like, well, this isn't a drawing day for me, so mm -hmm. I'm going to go do, um, I'm going to make a cup instead, or something like that. Yeah. Sounds very much like meditation. It's, it's a practice, and you, you develop your mind around that practice, and uh, eventually you've practiced so much that you can get into that mental space fairly easily, but yeah, sure, there, there are times that you can't get into that space. Once you're in the zone with this, it's, it just does itself. <laughs> You're just kind of going with the flow. But yeah, at first it can be, I don't know, that kind of goes with any kind of uh, glass work, though. Sometimes your, your first pieces are rusty and kind of not quite in the zone. The more you just stay on it, the more you fall into the zone and you get into it. And then your work starts coming out the way that you want it to come out rather than you know, throwing pieces away because actually I have a lot of, a lot of pieces that don't make the cut. Like I'll make it, and then after it comes out of the uh, annealer the next day, I don't, I don't want to sell it. I just keep it or give it away to a close friend or something. Mm -hmm. So another question off the web asking about torches. And wondering if there's a sort of a, a starter level torch that would put out a, a flame profile that you like for this style of work. Um, a Carlisle mm -hmm. will work for this technique. And that was what almost everyone in the studio was using. Um, but you could actually make your whole career using a Carlisle torch for this technique. Mm -hmm. And it would work just fine. Um, and that's much, much. Uh, lower price point than the Herbert Arnold. This is probably th a little over $3,000 for this torch, for this 40 mil model. Mm -hmm. um, you could get a Carlisle for around 900 bucks, I think. So yeah. big difference, definitely. Um, you could also, you could go ahead and get a GTT Phantom torch, which it's a little harder on it to do the small flame with the GTT, but it will hold up. Um, mm -hmm. Just you have to clean them every time you're done working if you're using the small flame a lot. And then it'll be totally OK. Mm -hmm. They, they um, build up a lot of carbon, is that? I, yeah, they do get that a little bit. Even I mean, the, the Arnold torch does get some, some carbon that you have to scrape off the end of the torch. And you'll actually notice that with the small flame on the GTT as well. Mm -hmm. The difference with the GTT is that the metal orifices on the face of the burner head are th thinner metal. So the metal heats up more rapidly. And if you're using small flames, it can actually start to glow a little bit and close the propane orifices of your torch. And that's easy to fix. I mean, you can send the torch back into GTT, and they can clean it. They'll do a shave off. They'll just shave the whole face of the burner head off and then send it back. Um, and that's not that big of a deal. But I think that you would probably get a few or even maybe five years of, of small flame work before your torch would need that kind of work. So. Um, that's another affordable option. The GTT Phantom is only $950, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's a great torch, really, and it's very versatile as well. Um, you're going to get flame sizes that you could work, you know, anything up to like 50 mil or even bigger tubing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it's versatile, and you can dial the flame in really well. So that's another choice. Mm -hmm. Good options on the market these days. The flame working world has been really exploding <coughs> in popularity and uh, a whole lot of folks getting into this style of glass working over the last decade or so. And it seems to be almost getting exponential how many people are, are diving into it. So the markets for our tools have expanded enormously. We have all sorts of different companies making new torches with different features to them. We've got 
companies making uh, new colored glasses that seem to be accelerating at an exponential pace. We get new colors coming out on a, almost a monthly basis. So the, the more we get artists to use all these, these materials, the more that uh, propels the ancillary markets of tools and color and, uh, and also collector bases as well. Thinking about what color I'm going to lay next. I'm not sure yet. I think I'm going to go back to this golden rod here. Another question off of the web. Where do you get your glass? Um, I've been buying my glass from DNL Art Supply in Denver lately. Um, they carry Cymax. That's what I've been using. Uh, Cymax Clear, and they had a lot of different color rod. I get a lot of my color from Glass Alchemy. Mm -hmm. I'm on their Gamma program. Um, I just, once you buy a certain amount of color per year, they um, add your points up and then put you on this gamma list, basically. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of color, so that's been nice to be on there. Um, I get color directly from North Star as well. But when I just need, like, you know, maybe a couple rods of color or something like that, I'll go down to DNL. They have a lot of stuff. I live in Denver, Denver area. I live in Evergreen. It's about 40 minutes west of Denver on the I-70, so it's about a 40-minute drive for me to get down there and get some color. Mm -hmm. It's a nice option to have. Yeah, you know, yeah it folks, is nice uh, to hand pick your color mm -hmm. because sometimes you'll order something and it'll come and it'll just be riddled with bubbles or something like that. So I prefer to look through it. So are there specific colors you will stay away from for this sort of pattern work? Or certain yeah, there are some colors that are you know, that can crack on you. Uh, some boro stick colors are dangerous. Um, one of them in particular I used to use a lot is the, uh, what was it called? Um, any of the greens, stay away from all boro stick green. Just check cracks no yeah. matter what you do. There's many other colors too. I'll get to that in a second here. So for those of you who have uh, just been joining us over the last few minutes here, uh, this is the, the amphitheater hot shop of the Corning Museum of Glass, and welcome to it. So typically in this space, we do furnace-style glass blowing. You see all these big ovens that we've got back here, and uh, we, we typically do uh, things like vases or bowls or some, some larger scale sculptural pieces in here. But we have a, a really special opportunity today and tomorrow we have a, a visiting artist. This is Yushin Goins, and he's come out here from Colorado to teach a class at our teaching facility across the parking lot. And uh, he's also sticking around for a couple extra days now that the class is finished to uh, show some of his, his skills and his process for our, our audiences here. So we have a, a really unique opportunity to see some very advanced glass making happening right here in the amphitheater. We have another. That's always a fun question. What would Yushin be doing for a living if he weren't making glass? Well, uh, that's pretty easy to answer. Before I got into glass blowing, I did construction work. Uh, mostly, I was like uh, 
I was basically just a worker guy that, you know, they'd say, hey, go pick up those two sheets of plywood, and I would go get them. <laughs> <laughs> or I'd be, like, up on the roof up high where other, other guys, you know, the main guys didn't want to go up there, and they'd, they'd be having me do stuff up there. Um, I worked on roofs a lot. Um, they always said if you fall off the roof, you're fired before you hit, you hit the ground. <laughs> one day I actually fell off. I jumped off, though, because I was going to fall, and I landed on my feet because I'm a skateboarder and did a little roll thing, and I'm like, I'm okay, I didn't get hurt, don't fire me. <laughs> but shortly after that, uh, yeah, gl uh, glass, glass came, came in as an idea. I had a friend who he uh, got into glass. I went to high school with him, and uh, he moved to L.A., and then he moved back to Oregon, and then that was why he moved back to Oregon was to try glass blowing. Um, his name is Mike Luna. Um, he lives in Southern Oregon. He does like dragons and um, he's really good at sculpting. And when we were younger in school, he was really good at drawing and he did a lot of like graffiti style art, which I kind of feel like I'm influenced by graffiti art quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I got to watch him work for about a year off and on, maybe like once a week for once, a, once every other week maybe. And uh, after watching him a few times, I tried glass blowing one day, and it just blew my mind. I, I was like, "Why didn't I try this sooner?" He was trying to get me to try it. I'd come into the studio, I'd be, I'd be asking him all these questions, and he'd be like, "Go over there and just jump on that torch over there and try just melt some glass." And I was like, "I don't want to. I don't want to do it." You know, I didn't want to do it. Finally, got on there. It was like, yeah, it was just electric energy. It was just like, "Oh, I got to do this," and I just didn't stop just kept doing it. I ended up uh, quitting my job. I was working at a smoke shop in Southern Oregon, quit my job on that, and then just spent all my time at the studio, pretty much 15 to 18 to 20 hours a day even. I mean, I, I lived in the studio. I lived up above it in this little teeny studio apartment with five other, five other artists. Didn't, didn't care that I was living in the corner with a you know, bag full of clothes and a pillow and a sleeping bag. I just wanted to do glass, so it's taken me a long way, though that passion's just continued as time has gone on, and um, this technique, now I'm like 10 years in on this technique and 18 years with glass, so it started in, I guess it was January 2000. kind of like blowing on each one after I draw the line because it cools a little bit faster and then I can wiggle and snap off the stringer. See if we can translate this question for you. Uh, what is he melt and whip off some colors, and some colors he sticks and then wiggles and breaks the stringer? So, like, uh, um, is there a difference in color? Reason why I do that? Basically? Yeah. Are there some that you snap as opposed to melt apart? Um, sometimes I do melt them apart. Um, when I'm filling an individual little teeny diamond space with one color, I'll do I'll just dab the color in there and and pull out because I want to actually leave I want to leave enough color there. If I were to wiggle snap after sticking one f filling one little individual space, um, it could pull too much color out as I wiggle and snap and pull away. So I like to. I like to just dab a little bit of color in those small spaces, but it doesn't matter which color I'm using um, as far as the uh, whether I wiggle snap or pull the color away. It just has to do with the space that I'm putting it into. Smaller spaces, I push it in there and then I leave a little bit at the tip. After, I, after that little tip is there, I take it and I push it down, heat it and I push it down with the uh, tungsten pick to kind of push that color into that space. All right, 
So, <laughs> let's see. Okay, let's hear these. Uh, is it possible to use a gold-fumed stringer for a filicello? Yes, so totally. You can use gold-fumed stringers. You can use any stringer you want. Mm -hmm. I filled in with clear, and then you just have the clear spaces in between all the, the regular lines, and that looks actually really cool. Mm -hmm. So with a gold fume, you'd have a light, you know, just a really light gold. Depends on he how heavy you fumed your rod before you pulled it into a stringer. Yeah. You'd probably have to fume the rod and then coat it with clear Trap um, it in there. really lightly and then pull that into a stringer and use that. Mm -hmm. That's just a guess. I don't know. You'd have to experiment. So we're, we're throwing a lot of jargon at those of you who don't work with glass here. Uh, so gold fuming. Uh, if you take a piece of very pure gold, 99.9% .9 purity, 24 karat gold, and uh, put it in the right mixture of gases in the torch flame, uh, you will start to fume that. It, it will start to off-gas, and you're actually spraying sort of gaseous uh, fumes of gold at another piece of glass that you can have further back in the flame, and you'll actually deposit some of that metal on the glass, which will give you some different color effects. And uh, a stringer are these thin pieces of glass that Yushin is using to draw in the pattern. So it's possible to color the glass by fuming it with gold, pull it out into a thin piece, and then draw this sort of pattern work in there. So sorry for all the, the flame working jargon for those of you who are not flame workers, but uh, that's how the, how the questions are coming in here. <laughs> how much time is spent on cold work for each pendant? I'm going to guess uh, that depends on which pendant. Well, it depends on the on the pendant and how big the pendant is um, and what kind of cut I want to do. But on average, I'd say I spend maybe two to three hours uh, doing faceting and stuff like that on a, mm -hmm. on a cab. And then I would heat it back up and then put the loop on. Mm -hmm. So cold working refers to what it sounds like, working the glass when it's cold, when it's room temperature. We can cut it, carve it, engrave on it. And what Yushin's referring to with faceting is uh, sort of creating flat geometric sides, like faceting a, a gemstone sort of an effect. So we can do that with glass as well. And what else do you have for questions here? Um, they're, they're coming in. <laughs> uh, so he's on oxygen and propane. The propane is set at about 15 psi, and the oxygen is about 30 psi. Is that your, well, your I typical have a secondary, comfort zone? Uh, I have a secondary regulator uh -huh. here that drops the pressure down to uh, less than 1 psi. So it's a, um, I was saying this earlier, but the pressure on this torch, it's a low pressure but a high volume of gas. So uh, the hose feeding the torch is pretty large, so um, it allows the gas to come in at a very low pressure, but for there to still be sufficient gas to you know, make a bigger flame like this if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Are there some colors Are there certain colors that are not really cut out for small and detailed work? Um, yes, there definitely are. Um, any color that could cause incompatibility, like the boro stick colors like I was talking about. Um, there's also some other colors out there that I just kind of steer clear of. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're known to cause any incompatibility, like uh, they could check later on, like maybe like heavy blue leprechaun yeah. things, made by things Trotman. With some chromium, um, probably. It's a great color, but if you if you work it too much, uh, you'll wake up the next day and your piece will have little crack marks all through it. I don't generally use that color in these. Back in the day, I did a little bit until I had a couple of them crack and then mm -hmm. kind of learned my lesson. <laughs> Okay, so for the beginners mm. out there in the, the glass world. Uh, um, <coughs> so something I didn't have access to when I started 
was uh, the ability to take classes, or you know, there weren't really much. There wasn't really much available as far as classes go, mm -hmm. and uh, that made it kind of hard. As a beginner glass blower, I would have loved to take a class, but I didn't get to. So that's one thing I could recommend to a new glass blower would be get out there and take some of these really amazing classes that are being offered. You know, put in your application at Corning or at Pilchuck or at Penland or you know Glasscraft or wherever you want to go to take a class um, anywhere that you see one. They're being taught at a lot of other smaller places. I'm actually going to Rochester, New York after this to teach another class at um, the studio called Arc and Flame. And um, I think there's about 10 students in that class. Um, just get out there and take, take classes because the, the inf you know, it's out there now. When yeah. I started, it wasn't there. So that's what I would redo. I'd be, <coughs> I would have been taking classes as much as I could. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it seems like in this day and age, there are a lot of folks who are taking advantage of opportunities to learn via social media opportunities or YouTube videos, and uh, you can learn a ton that way. I've, I've definitely been picking up a, a lot of new tricks off of YouTube videos lately, but it seems like you just can't beat being in person with your instructor. Uh, you, you just can't see the same things through uh, the lens of a camera or off of a monitor that you can really see in person. And there, there's so many subtleties to glass making <coughs> that uh, to be there in person, to make the mistakes with the instructor right there in the room with you, to work you through those mistakes, you, you just really can't beat that sort of a format. And the, the web has definitely opened up a, a lot of great possibilities and opportunities for sharing information, but still that person-to-person that -person sharing of information on a, a craft like this. You, you simply can't beat that. So who are some up and coming emerging artists that you're impressed with these days? Um, that's, that's a great question. There's a, a lot of really good talent coming out now. Um, a name that comes to mind right off the bat is this kid named Avatar. He's, his real name is actually Avatar. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina. I think he's uh, been on the torch maybe four or five years, not very long at all, but his, his level of skill has just skyrocketed because of all the access to information, like YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so he's already at a level that <coughs> took me 10 years to get at, but he got there in like four years. So that's how a lot of glass blowing is nowadays. Just people have more access to information. It's easier to learn. Um, we actually have a really awesome artist here. Uh, this is Tim. He goes by Ease. He's out here in the audience. Stoked to have him here watching. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of other really amazing artists that literally got good in like two years. And I could probably go down a long list, but. I can't think of too many right off the bat. I just named one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Works for us. <laughs> we'll let you try to focus on what you're doing also. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Can you use a plumber's torch to make small scale stuff? Uh, yes, but <laughs> you could probably answer this one. Yeah, I'll jump Go on ahead. that one for you. Uh, a plumber's torch, it is possible, but odds are it's not going to be the, the right mix of gases that you're looking for. A, a plumber's torch, if you're uh, talking about like map gas, you can get some glasses hot enough with map gas, uh, soda lime softer glasses, you could work it over a, a torch like this. It is hot enough to soften certain glasses, but uh, oftentimes you're not getting enough oxygen mixed into the flame and you'll tend to discolor some of the glasses. Uh, so it is possible to maybe start doing some rudimentary shaping of, of softer glasses over a, a, a plumber's torch, but it's not gonna give you the, the quality of results you, you'll want over the long term. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, the, the torches we typically flame work over run on either natural gas or propane mixed with oxygen. And uh, the, the glass will react differently to different mixtures of those gases. So uh, for a certain level of quality of work, it, it does require a certain quality of equipment as well to make sure you're putting out accurate enough flames for the, the work you're doing. So yeah, you can try to melt glass on anything that will get hot enough to get it moving. But uh, to get the ultimate results, it's, right, it, it's really helpful to have the, the right melting technology. And for the, the glass that Yushin's using here, this is borosilicate glass. It has a, a relatively high melting temperature as opposed to many other glasses. So you really need oxygen mixed in with the, the fuel to get that heat accelerated to the point where you can melt this, uh, this high of a melt temperature glass. And every once in a while, we'll even mix in hydrogen and oxygen if we need to melt an extremely high temperature uh, glass, something like a few silica or quartz. They don't start melting until they're pretty close to 4,000 Fahrenheit. So mixing in hydrogen makes that possible. Just pull the stringer off the end of here. We'll see if I, oh, I made it too hot. <laughs> so for those folks who are curious about Yushin's stringer process, if you, you missed the first hour of him working here from about nine to 10 this morning, he was pulling the majority of his stringers and he does go through a, a very specific process for that to make sure he's not trapping any air bubbles in the glass that will uh, affect the quality of the finished work later. So when he goes to pull a stringer, he doesn't just heat right off the very end of the rod, but he heats a, a little ways into the end of the rod with yep. the, uh, the idea being that he's melting a little further in, and if there's any air trapped, that molten glass is going to squeeze together and push the air out to the sides. So the actual material that he's pulling the stringer from won't have any air in it. Any, any potential air has been pushed out uh, away from that glass that he's incorporating into his stringer. If you're mixing hydrogen, does the color of the flame change in any specific way? Uh, it does. It's uh, actually not very bright when you work with hydrogen. Uh, it can be tough to see the flame, but Dangerous. when <laughs> yeah, when uh, but it's incredibly hot. So when you work glass with hydrogen, uh, typically you're going to wear glasses that have sort of a bifocal that are very heavily tinted on the bottom and not so tinted on the top. Uh, you want the not so tinted area before the glass starts to get molten so you can actually see the flame. But then you wear a, a, a 13 welding shield on the bottom. As soon as that quartz glass does get molten, it is extremely bright white and you really need to protect your eyes from it. So uh, yeah, hydrogen is a, a bit of a different sport. So uh, I, have a, I have a question actually. Um, mm -hmm. With quartz glass, what are the ingredients of quartz glass? What are the ingredients of quartz glass? Yeah. Quartz. Just pure quartz. Like pure quartz. It's just quartz, is that it? Yeah. Quartz that has been, uh, it's gone through some filtering processes and then remelted into tubing or rod. Wow. Yeah. So they, it does go through a little purification. What's the melting temperature of quartz? Uh, about 4,000 Fahrenheit. Wow. Yeah. So this is 2350, quartz is 4,000? Yeah. OK. A lot hotter. <laughs> hot, it's hot. <laughs> yeah, and quartz, when you come out of the flame, you have a split second to get it to move. And then it just sort of locks right into place. So it's, uh, yeah, it is pretty tricky to work with. Very. I tried making uh, a couple of things out of quartz just for fun, just to melt it. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, a funny prank that people will do is they'll take and put a <laughs> a tube of 12 millimeter tubing of quartz on your station and you'll be like, whoa, this won't melt. And you'll like break your reamer and <laughs> trying to open it up and stuff. 
It's not a good prank. Don't do it. <laughs> or do, but. So there, there are <laughs> tens of thousands of different recipes for glass out there in the world. And uh, we change glass recipes for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, we may change a glass recipe just to color the glass. So to color glass, we add different metal oxides and different elements from the Earth's crust in with uh, the ingredients for clear glass so we can change its color. Uh, sometimes we change ingredients in glass because we need different working properties from the glass. And uh, what I mean by working properties is really how long it stays soft for or how quickly it might stiffen up. Uh, the glass that Yushin's using here, borosilicate glass, is what we call a hard glass. It tends to not stay soft for very long. So as he comes out of the flame, uh, if he were to heat the entire tube, he'd maybe have 20 seconds or, or so to do some shaping. Whereas if he had a tube made of the glass that we have in the furnace here and got it to the same temperature, same amount of mass, he might have a minute to shape it. So different processes, you might want a glass that's softer or stiffer, uh, particularly when it comes to machining glass. So we use machines to make things like bottles or window glass and uh, to get very precise movements from the glass while it's being machined. We might engineer the glass very specifically for that specific process. Uh, something like if, if you own a bottle factory, you make more money by having your machine make more bottles per hour. So you want a glass that as soon as that machine blows it into the mold, it's gonna hold the shape of the mold and you can get it out of the mold and get more glass in there and make more product faster. So for a process like that, we want a short glass, one that doesn't stay soft for very long. But when we do furnace style glass blowing, where we're gathering glass from a furnace, we want to get all the way to the bench and do some shaping. We want a glass that stays softer for longer. So we use a, a different recipe and, and wind up with a long glass for something like that. And then uh, another reason why we might change the ingredients in a glass is if we need the finished product to be able to perform a certain way. And that's a, another special thing about this glass here. I mentioned it's borosilicate. There's a little bit of boron oxide added to this that you won't typically find in other glasses. And uh, that helps this glass not to expand and contract so much with heating and cooling. And uh, by not expanding and contracting so much, it tolerates temperature change a lot better than other glasses. Uh, most glasses, if you heat them or cool them too quickly, they tend to crack. This stuff tolerates really quick changes in temperature. So all sorts of different glasses out there in the world and all sorts of considerations as to why you might adjust formulae. All right, so <laughs> when Yushin gets into the shaping of the disc, uh, it is, is, is it going to be a similar shaping to shaping a flower implosion, or is it a different sort of thing? I'm going to suggest that it is a different sort of thing. And, um, uh, I am going to do a different technique than I did on this pendant that I have here as an example up front. Um, I'm going to make a bubble of colored glass, and I'm going to attach this pattern, once I have it all finished and cut out and everything, to the end of this bubble, and work it in. And I'm going to create a thin disk that's um, squared on the edges. And um, I'm going to pop two holes in it so that you can actually use it as a pendant. But it will just look like a disk, so it won't have this bale at the top. Gotcha.
getting towards the end of this uh, coloring process here, filling all this in, which is exciting. Pretty soon here we can start turning this into a cab to put into the pendant. Probably another 30 minutes I think I'll be ready to start shaping this. Any uh, good general tips for flipping the disc? There, well, I will get to that when I when I get to that part. Definitely, I'll I'll explain the process. Mm -hmm. um, I could explain how you could make it into a section that you would put into a pendant or mm -hmm. one for maybe a hollow section. Um, I'm going to actually be doing the technique to. Uh, make this a hollow section because uh, instead of backing it with color like I did on this pendant over here, it'll, it'll just, just, it's basically just a different way of making a pendant, but same idea more or less. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Hang in there, internet folks. You're going to see all these steps. I'm getting there. I'm close. <laughs> I'll take that one. What type of glass would be better for a beginner to start on, soft or borrow? Or if, if you have any commentary, you can definitely chime in oh, on that, yeah. Eugene. Well, I mean, obviously, it's a little less expensive to have your own studio at home with borrow. You, can, you could probably get completely set up for a few grand. Mm -hmm. um, soft glass, you can, you can rent time at a lot of studios, and there are beginner classes that you can take. So you can get into soft glass as well, and it doesn't cost too much. You, you wouldn't even have to have any equipment. So, um, and the same goes with Boro too. I mean, I'm sure you could take classes without owning any of your own equipment, mm -hmm. and you could rent the equipment to learn. Um, what about yeah? So they both kind of lend well to it. But I think that as far as having a home studio after you start learning, this is going to be a lot easier. Boro is going to be a lot easier. Do you have any thoughts on strictly flame working soft glass versus boro? Um, I haven't done it too much. Mm -hmm. I've dabbled a little bit. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see is bead making, so they're kind of uh, using a bead mandrel and gathering a, a little bit of colored glass around it, like coiling it on and then doing dot work on the top mm -hmm. of the bead. For that kind of thing, it's it's a real low heat, and you don't need a really hot torch, mm -hmm. so that that can be easier to get into at first. Uh, actually, an, an artist that I can think of right off the top of my head that started that way is uh, Yoshinori Kondo uh, mm -hmm. from Japan. His work's super detailed. He does dot work. He started with soft glass, making soft glass beads. I think that actually Tim is wearing one of them right now. I saw him wearing it earlier. <laughs> it's Score. badass. If you want to look at it, um, take a look. Yeah, Very Bor small dot Boro, work. Uh, I'll, I'll throw my two cents on the, the answer also. Yeah, Bor go for Boro it. is definitely a more forgiving glass. But in my experience, if you can learn how to work soft glass on the torch, 
it uh, sort of teaches you what glass wants and needs on a very specific material level, and it can make working borrow even easier. I could see that. Yeah. So it, it is tough to start learning complex sculpture in soft glass. It's uh, easy enough to start learning it in sort of bead forms. That's, that's a reasonable way to get started. But uh, soft glass really reacts differently than borosilicate. So boro tends to be more forgiving in most situations. Might be a little easier to learn certain types of objects on, uh, especially hollow forms or sculptural forms. But uh, there's some serious benefits to learning soft glass on the torch as well. So I'd say just get started, whatever you can get your hands on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what materials cost for soft glass uh, for flame working, but mm -hmm. I imagine it's not too terribly expensive. It's pretty cheap. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that would be another consideration. I, th I generally recommend people start just with clear glass anyways, no matter what you're beginning in. But if you want to get started and get into some colors, uh, soda lime colored glasses are a lot cheaper than borosilicate glass. So if you're really curious just to experiment with coloring glass, then maybe the soft glass might be a less expensive route to go. But uh, as far as more forgiving for your shaping and uh, getting sculpture off the ground. Borosilicate's definitely more forgiving there. What? <laughs> Maybe somebody in the audience knows this. Do you, what? Do you prefer Wook Trap or New Trap? <laughs> Wook trap. Wook trap. There it is. All right. Whatever that means, you've gotten your answer. Uh. <laughs> and is there a way to harden the end result to gain the level of like real glass? Is there a way to harden the end result to something like, say, gorilla glass? You could answer that. You might want maybe. me to answer that yep. one. <laughs> um, well, Gorilla Glass refers to uh, a, a Corning Incorporated product that is strengthened through a, a special chemical process of actually taking the glass and you dip it into a bath of molten potassium. And uh, what that causes is uh, really a situation that's more referred to as tempering. And you, you hear about tempered glass in your car. Your, your side windows and your, your back window are always tempered. Uh, so what happens is you create a compressive force on the surface. So the surface of the glass is sort of pushing in and the interior is pulling. So you've created a, a very tough outer surface, but if you can break through that outer surface, there is a, a lot of weakness that just wants to give way on the inside. Um, so we can create that by changing temperatures of the glass really quickly or we can create it by chemical effects. Uh, borosilicate glass is not an ideal glass for that chemical process, that chemical strengthening process. I'm not even sure that it works with this glass. Uh, there's probably some way to do it, but uh, if you're going to do that sort of strengthening process, you're probably going to use what's known as alumina silicate, not borosilicate. Uh, so as far as hardening this more, I'm not sure that you can do that with this glass, especially with all the colors on there. I, I don't know that there is a process that would really make it noticeably tougher. Uh, it's still going to scratch with the same amount of force and will we'll only uh, take on the, the same amount of physical pressure as well. Interesting question, though. What do we got? Is there an element they mix in the glass that determines the COE? Uh, there are, and I, I've, I am not a chemist by any stretch. <laughs> uh, you can adjust COE with different ingredients. So there, there are many different ingredients that can adjust it up and down. 
for those of you who are not familiar with our, our jargon here, uh, COE refers to coefficient of thermal expansion. So as glass is heated, it's sort of swelling on the atomic level, and as it cools, it's contracting. So for glasses to be compatible, uh, for them to, to work together and hold together in a finished object, they need to be very close in that rate of expansion and contraction. So uh, the, the glass that Yushin's using here, this borosilicate glass, tends to be around a, a coefficient of about 33. So anywhere really from about 32 to 34 is where you'll, you'll typically find artistic borosilicate glasses. Uh, as opposed to the glass in our furnace here, which is a 96 COE. If we try to put those two glasses together, they will stick together while they're hot, but as they're cool, they will peel apart. And uh, actually, it's a pretty cool see. You can thing do a cool see. test, actually. Yeah, let's um, do that. One of, the, one of the nice tests you can do with boro of different kinds, say you get a, a stick of boro and you've like, I've never seen this color, I wonder what it does. You can take it and you could, uh, you could attach it to clear. You could have clear on one side and color on the other side, and you could pull a uh, ribbon, basically, with you know the clear on one side, color on the other, and then you let it cool. It's perfectly straight when you pulled it, but as it cools, um, it'll either bow one way or the other, um, and that will kind of tell you what the COE is. If it's the same COE, it'll stay straight. If it's not, it'll bow. It's a great little test to do, though. If you're like, this is cracking everything I've made lately, and then you do that test and you find out it's totally, totally off on COE, then there's your answer. Another nice trick, if you have a kiln that you feel like isn't getting hot enough or for some reason doesn't seem like it's hot enough, you can take a rod and turn on a really dirty flame like this and get carbon all over it, put it in the kiln all carboned up, and in about 15 minutes, the carbon should burn off if your temperature is at, if your kiln is at temperature. If it's not at temperature, the carbon will just stay on there. Or you might see some like spotting where on the back part of the kiln it burned off, but as you get farther towards the front, the carbon's still on the rod. It's kind of another cool test to do. Kiln, kiln testing. You can like diagnose a kiln too, because sometimes there's cold spots in your kiln. You can go, oh, I want my piece to be hot, and I want it to anneal correctly. Then you can put it in the right part of the kiln where it's, where it's actually at temperature. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Do you need some boro? Yeah, I was just gonna pull a little cane out I of this. I can heat up this rod really quick and just get it molten. All right. Barely even wants to stick on there. That's it crazy. It did stick, though. Yep. <laughs> Are you going to pull a stringer? Yeah. Oh, cool. We can see this trick here in action. You can do it in the flame if you want. <laughs> yeah, I'll try it with this. Here, I got a rod here. I could grab onto that. Didn't even really get hot enough to stretch the boro, but I'll leave this on the table here, and as it cools, it'll just pop apart. Yeah, that map gas isn't really hot enough to even get boro moving. 
<laughs> but as these cool, they uh, they should separate in a couple of seconds here. Should. That'll be kind of cool when it pops apart, huh? It's just gonna be like blink. <laughs> it That's when you apart. know your boro is really incompatible. If it breaks apart after you've made a ribbon, then you're like, oh, don't use that on anything. that hasn't popped yet, but it is bound to. Every once in a while, glass surprises you, too. <laughs> On rare occasions. I heard a rumor that there were uh, there was someone who, maybe it was uh, Lucio Bavaco, who uh, transitioned from soft glass to boro by mixing um, boro and soft glass together in different ratios until he got, he changed the ratio all the way to from, from one to the other by making little bits and connecting them all. I don't know if that's true. I haven't seen him do that all the way to boro. Oh, okay. I'm not sure, but definitely between different soda lime glasses, uh, I've seen him do that. We call it a graded seal. It's something that's done in the, the scientific glass blowing industry also, and you have to join different materials. The, the general rule of thumb is on that scale of coefficient of expansions. You can really only connect glasses that are within about three points, typically. Uh, there are some anomalies to that as well. So essentially, you're mixing glasses with different COEs in different percentages to fill that gap. So the glasses Lucio would typically work with would be 104 to 90 or 96, somewhere in that range. So if you make a, a few percentage steps, you could fill that range in, what, maybe four graded seals, something like that. But to go all the way from 104 to 33 to bond it with Boro would... Might be impossible. That's a lot of steps. <laughs> it's, okay, my rumor was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably possible, but man, you'd, uh, you'd have to go through great pains, and that's a, a lot of transitions. I would say so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a challenge, huh? Sounds like <laughs> one. <laughs> Let's go. I don't know if I want to do it, but... <laughs> we'll be here all night mixing glasses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there are, there are some ways around coefficients of expansion being within that three-point range, too. There's uh, different viscosities of glasses, even within those different coefficients of expansion. And if, if you can get a balance of how it's moving due to temperature versus its viscosity at certain temperatures, you can get very varied glasses to work together, but uh, probably not something you want to experiment with in your, your A-quality artwork. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, we got that question a few minutes ago on the web, too. So you want to, oh, sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes you're snapping the rod apart. Sometimes, sometimes you're I'm snapping it. it, and sometimes I'm letting, you know, the really small spaces, the ones that are like, they're probably only one millimeter in diameter that I'm putting color into, I'm, uh, I'm pulling uh, away and, and leaving a little bleb of color on the end. Then I heat that bleb of color up and I push it down with the tungsten just because I want enough color in that little space. If I wiggle snap on a, such a small space, every once in a while it won't stick and it'll just take a big chunk of color with it. So that's part of the reason why I do that. Um, on the bigger spaces, I can get away with wiggle snap because I have more movement. Um, the glass is moving in a direction. So I was just examining our, our little combination of soda lime and borosilicate, and it did crack. It, it popped off of the, the mass that I pulled out there. And on the, the soda lime side, the glass is really webbed out and cracked like crazy. Borosilicate side, didn't. I don't think it cracked at all. It looks like it's perfectly clean through there. And uh, my, my theory on that is that the soda lime glass has a much broader uh, 
coefficient of thermal expansion. It's trying to move a whole lot more than the borosilicate, so it's going to put itself under more strain, and it's going to break into more pieces. There's, there's more energy trying to pull. All right, I've filled this thing in all the way, but I still have to do wh what I like to do anyways is a, uh, a gradient of different uh, colors. All these colors that I've used, I'm going to kind of do rings of them on the back side here, and it just gives a really nice look on the outer edge of the pendant. Kind of frame in the look a bit. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. exactly. So I'm kind of melting this in a little bit. So now all the colors on. Twisting both directions on the marver pad here. So I don't want to twist up any of my work that I've spent four or five hours doing. If you aren't careful, can that design start to smear? Oh, uh, 100%. I've had that happen so many times. Um, it usually happens when I use too hot of a flame and I heat up the base lines, the black and white lines I have underneath here. If I heat those up, I will totally, totally smear them as I'm laying the color on top. Mm -hmm. So I have to be careful. Less heat. Everybody's curious about whether or not you have a coffee habit. <laughs> it's a popular um, question. <laughs> I like coffee. I don't drink a whole lot because um, I love the flavor of coffee. But if I have more than one cup, it affects how I draw the lines. Sure. Yep. Um, and honestly, one cup is pushing it. A lot of times I drink like, I like European sized coffees. I can drink that size coffee. Yeah. It's like a little teeny one, you know. Nice. When I was in Barcelona, I was drinking the uh, Café con Leches. It's like milk with coffee in the morning. That's what they call mm -hmm. that. And then uh, you have in the afternoon, you have what's called a Cortado. And it's like a small coffee. And it's, it's a, uh, no, what is it? The first one's milk with coffee. And then it's coffee with milk. And you switch it around. And then in the evening, you just have espresso, which is, you know, just pure. Sounds good. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> And I never felt uh, shaky from that or anything. The doses of coffee they give you over there are much smaller. And yep. I didn't get, um, and now if I go get a Starbucks in the morning and get like a large size, mm -hmm. I'm going to be unable to draw almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know uh, I, I heard one of the old engravers for Stuben Glass years ago talking about how he gave up coffee and gave up alcohol to steady his hands for that level of engraving. So sometimes you, you have to make some commitments to the work for a certain level of work. You gotta keep your body in a, a certain condition. I have found that when I drink less alcohol, um, I can draw the lines cleaner as yeah. well. Um, honestly, 100% sober is how I prefer to do this kind of work. Yeah. I do my best work when I'm not affected by anything. Mm -hmm.
So for those of you just coming in, welcome to the library at the Corning Museum of Glass. <laughs> ah, this is our hot shop amphitheater, uh, but we've got deep concentration going on in here. Uh, typically in the amphitheater hot shop, we uh, do so fairly large scale glass blowing projects, things like vases and bowls and goblets and uh, a lot of the, the objects that you typically think of for blown glass. But we have a really special opportunity both today and tomorrow we have a visiting artist. Now, this is Yushin Goins, who is visiting from Colorado. And uh, he was here this whole past week teaching a, a class on uh, some techniques that he is a, a renowned master of at our teaching facility across the, the parking lot here, the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. And uh, we are lucky enough that he is willing to stick around for a couple of extra days and really show how he makes his work. Now, typically, demonstrations here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We keep most of them between about 15 and 25 minutes or so. And uh, that allows us to make pretty decent objects that really represent the, the glass blowing process pretty well. But to make more advanced objects, it takes a lot more time. And uh, Yushin is spending the entire day working on a very detailed pendant form. And, uh, walk around and, and show you guys the sort of patterning we're going for here. I don't know if you ladies have seen what we're shooting for here. I'll, I'll hang on to that for you but super detailed geometric pattern work going on there. So he's been working on the, the pattern itself on the outside of a, a piece of cylindrical tubing, just about done doing the patterning, and now it'll be time to change the shape into a, a pendant form. So we're, we're getting through some of the steps here. And to make this level of work with this level of detail takes all day. Anybody else up top who hasn't seen this yet, you guys? I'm getting my exercise, good. Yeah, so super finely detailed geometric pattern. This, this is what he's making. And where you see him decorating on the outside of the tube, that is actually the back side of, of the pendant. So as he finishes laying the color, he's gonna change the shape of that and open it up so we see the pattern revealed from the inside. Pretty crazy, right? And he's gonna do all that shaping without destroying the pattern also. Yeah, he sure did. Yeah, pretty amazing work. And you're not often gonna see uh, somebody demonstrating this level of work in, in public. So it's a pretty, pretty good opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> How long has Yushin been working glass, and how did he get started? Oh, well, <laughs> you I kind of mentioned it one? earlier, but yeah. <laughs> I could say it again, I guess. Uh, I started in the year 2000 in Southern Oregon, and uh, I originally had a job working at a smoke shop where I actually had access to see some like detailed pipes, and I sort of got to know glass through pipes just looking at these pipes. And then one of my friends started blowing glass, my friend Mike Luna, that I went to high school with. And I would, over the course of about a year, watch him once a week 
maybe twice, twice a week, maybe less than that, maybe only like once a month, but I would go watch him and he would always say, hey, you should try it, and I didn't want to try it. I just wanted to watch and kind of learn about it so that I could tell customers in the store more about the techniques that went into the pieces they were buying. And then um, one day I tried it and that was kind of just it. I ended up moving into the studio, living in this little studio apartment above the studio, working every day for even up to 20 hours just because I was so stoked on glass and that's just kept going and here I am now. <laughs> yeah. Had a lot of help along the way, a lot of other artists nice. helped me, yeah. And you've, you've lived in parts of the country where you've uh, been around good glass communities as well and sort of been around a, a community of folks who have really helped to build the, the flame working scene over the last couple of decades. So. Yeah, definitely. Good community be, to be a part of. The studio where I work now in Evergreen, Colorado, I share with uh, five other artists, uh, WJC Glass, Nate Myers, Adam G, um, Joe Peters, and Elbow. So those, are my sh those guys are my shop mates, and they're, they're a huge inspiration to me, all for different reasons. They're s just mega talented. They're you know, leaders in the field of what we do. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So many artistic movements through the course of history, you see uh, communities of artists who really come together to, to move uh, an artistic movement forward. And we're, we're seeing it in the flame working world these days as well. It seems like some of the folks who are accelerating the fastest are, are deep within those communities of, uh, of glass workers who are sharing information and sharing results and techniques. We all accelerate a lot faster by sharing information. All right, I got a couple more lines to do and then I'm gonna actually start the process of flipping this. Probably gonna get it done right at four. Just like you were planning. Yeah, hopefully. So right now on the inside, this doesn't really look like much because it's just all this color pushed to the outside. It's almost kind of like reverse painting. The stuff that I want to see in the foreground, I put on first. And then all the other stuff that's farther in the background, I put on after that.
There we go. I got all the color on finally. Woo! <laughs> well, golf clap for getting all the color on there. There we go. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That only took five hours. Uh, detail takes time in glass working. We've, we get that <coughs> question all the time. What takes the longest to make? Well, the more detail you put into an object, the longer it takes, whether it's color pattern or sculptural detail. Uh, building up mass can happen fairly quickly, but uh, it's really the, the details that you gotta, you gotta spend lots of time on. And to get high quality details takes even more patience and more, more attention to every level of your process. And Yushin, right from the very beginning of this process, just pulling those little threads of glass that he uh, does for all his color work there, he's very precise and even how he just prepares those. So they, uh, they work well for him as he's applying them. They work properly all the way through the, the melting and shaping. Every step of the process matters to come out with a, a high quality object. So right now I'm, uh, I'm thickening the end of this, this tube. There's a little bit of extra clear on the end and I'm kind of just gathering it up. I'm thickening it up. I'm gonna do the uh, termination and actually a term I came up with in this class that I just taught across the way here was uh, I do this thing where I, I gather up a bunch of glass on the end and it creates this kind of like sharp Maria. I was calling it a, a, the termination of volio because it kind of looks like an volio. And then uh, that creates this thick glass close to where the color ends. And then when I go to pull this, I don't disturb uh, or pull too much color from one side or other, another side of the, the color on the end. It pulls all evenly. And then when my termination's pulled out, it's even, it's not uh, crooked or something like that. And by termination, you're talking about the center of the pattern where it comes yep. together. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There's a little piece of soft glass on the tip of this rod. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> funny. I put it in the flame and it went bing. Nice. Good catch. <laughs> yeah. So this is where I'm going to gather this up a little bit, kind of heat it up, turn up my flame a little bit. Been using a much softer flame this whole this whole time, so just increasing the heat a little bit. I kind of get a nice bit of glass that I've added onto the end of here, and once I get it melted down close to the color, I'm gonna push it on my marver pad to create a sharp Maria. There we go. Some thicker glass there on the end. It looks like the opposite of what you would want to do to do the termination is to add more glass to the end, but sometimes you have to add it so you can take it away. Just making sure that it's as straight as I can make it. I'm gonna actually, as this cools, I'm gonna hold these uh, handles out towards the ends more so that it, um, the errors of my hands rotating are not amplified, or they are amplified so I can see the imperfections. So now I'm just gonna let this set up. I'm gonna keep it warm back here a little bit because it's starting to get cold back there. Looks like I caught one little air bubble. I'm not gonna fret too much about it. Sometimes I can pop them though. So I have a special air bubble popping technique. We'll get to that later. Okay, so now I've got a s nice, small, sharp, hot flame. 
I'm going to heat this up right at the end, right where the color ends on the tip here, right where, right next to the uh, the Maria that I pushed together there. That Maria kind of it doesn't get hot as quickly as the tubing gets hot, where the color is. So it serves as a a stopping point where the the when I pull this apart, the color will stay at that last stopping point against the the Ovolio or the the Maria. And then I pull away, and it pulls evenly. Slowly heating it and waiting till it gets the right temperature. Then I slowly start pulling apart, and really slow at first. And I'm not twisting at all. Both hands are spinning at the same speed as much as I can. And starting to come out here. We got a nice even pull here. I'm pretty happy with it. And then I'm going to take this out of the flame and just continue pulling this down. Keeping my hand spinning, same speed, keeping this straight. And I'm going to keep that just like that for now. It's pulled out. It's not pulled all the way off. And then I'm um, going to go and melt the back part here. The reason I don't pull this all the way off is because I'd have to immediately punty right back up to it. So rather than puntying back up to the freshly pulled off end, I'm just going to go and keep that there, keep it sort of connected. It's kind of like a point. Now I'm heating up right behind the uh, color rings that I did. I'm going to give it a little puff. It's kind of starting the back bubble. This is the bubble that I'm going to actually uh, turn this into a, well, I'll flip this design around the other way, basically. So you need that full amount of clear there to be able to form the shapes you need to get this flipped open? Yeah, I need a little extra clear in the back. That's why I left that there, mm -hmm. so that I can actually flatten this pattern out. And you'll see as that happens. Right now, it's like, how is he going to do that? But you'll see. Mm -hmm. Just keep gathering this up, adding, heating up, adding a little bit more of this clear tubing into the bubble oh. of clear that I have going and puffing it out. And I'm going to gather up all this 19 mil I have. a little bit bigger of a flame here and kind of gather this up a little bit more. Sometimes I don't have enough clear on the back side, and I have to add a little more, which is never fun to do, but you got to do it sometimes. I think I have enough here. 
my rule is is uh, if you draw on one third of the tube, then the other two thirds should be clear so that you can flatten the design out afterwards. trying to make this clear bubble as even as possible because I want this, this pattern to spin out evenly or to flip evenly. Basically how these patterns work is anything that you do to them in the beginning reverberates out to the pattern in the end. If you have something that's one millimeter off in the beginning of drawing it, that one millimeter could translate to quite a bit in the end. That's why I use calipers. Like earlier this morning when I was drawing this, I was using calipers to uh, make little marks and dots on the tube to draw the lines. So I could, I, I could have it be as precise as possible. Trying to create an even heat base, that's why I pulled out the front of the flame. Okay, that's going to be good. I'm going to finish the uh, termination in a second here. I've just got to make a smaller soft flame. The color is really sensitive at the uh, end of where I'm going to terminate this, so I have to be really careful. I have to use a really small soft flame to pull this off. If I use too hot of a flame, I'll, I'll boil the color on the end. So I'm pulling this out and rotating my hands at the same speed. And then at the very end, they're kind of twisting back and forth as I pull the rest off. And I'm going to pull out here in this soft flame, just do a couple more times of pulling the color off. I stop rotating when I pull, because I, I don't want there to be a twisted rotation in the middle of my termination. I want it to come perfectly to a point, just like I think that that could be good enough. Just trying to take a look at it and see if there's any twist going on, anything like that. I'm going to melt it a little bit and see how it feels. Seems pretty good. I think I'm going to do a couple more pulls off the end of this. It's a question of what you mean by soft when you're referring to your soft flame. Not pushing very hard, so um, I probably am not even at a, uh, what would be called a neutral flame. I'm probably on a more oxidizing flame. Mm -hmm. So less propane, less oxygen, probably, a, but as far as ratios go, a little more on the propane side than the oxygen side. And you're, you're really concerned with the thrust of the gases yeah. pushing out of the, the face oh, of the torch? Yeah, big time. If, yeah. you, if you have gases pushing out 
too hard, it can, uh, that's what causes the boiling. Yep. Like if I were to use a flame like, like this or something, it would just boil the color immediately right now. Mm -hmm. So I have to be really careful. I have to turn everything down really soft, yep. soft heat. And I can notice a difference in your candles in the flame also. Yeah, they, the candle gets bigger softer. on the Arnold torch. Mm -hmm. I can actually help that by turning this on. This is a flame optimizer. Hmm. It's a little knob. <laughs> gets rid of the bright candles a little. Mm -hmm. And I'm also not aiming the flame right at the, the very tip of where I terminated this. I'm kind of just a tad back from the end. And I'm like melting it a little bit, puffing it a little bit. Letting heat sort of radiate from the thicker spots out to that point. Yeah, I'm trying to even out the, uh, the thickness too, because it got really thin on the end from doing the termination. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of air bubbles, one of which I see that I might be able to get rid of Did you hear that sound? That was me actually pushing an air bubble with the tungsten pick cold, and it broke It broke through with the tungsten pick. And then uh, I can actually go back with a small flame and close it up. It's a different style of cold working than you typically see. It really makes a difference, I mean, because you, you just completely get rid of that air bubble. I see another one, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it. It would be nice to get it, but... It hasn't worked itself to the surface. If I melt this a little more, it might come to the surface a bit more. Sort of impossible to avoid air bubbles, so I try to pop the ones I can and get rid of them. The ones that I can't get. It's a maker's mark. So I found another one. Sometimes the mini torch can help them come to the surface. You got to be careful though, because it's it can boil the color. So I'm kind of doing this waving pattern. I just uh, kind of push this one to the surface, and I broke it. Those were like the two biggest ones, so any other little ones I'm not going to worry too much about. the air bubbles that I can pop, basically. <laughs> Another golf clap from up top there. Yes, yes. <laughs> so back to uh, turning this into a disc. I'm going to flip this whole thing now.
I'm still using a nice soft flame. I'm not trying to overheat the color. I'm always spinning one direction, then spinning the other direction, so I don't twist my pattern. If you twist one of these up, it's like the worst feeling. Just, I just spent five hours and <laughs> twisted everything up. Do you have anything that you do with the twisted ones? Or do they just go in the bucket? Um, I can untwist them. That's the good thing. Uh, yeah. At what point in the process do you untwist them before it's all the way flipped? Um, yeah, definitely. Like if I see that I twisted it at this point, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll lightly connect a punty to the end mm -hmm. and then heat it very gently and twist it back. It's very rare that I twist them nowadays, but maybe if I got distracted, it could happen. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Should be able to do that. Sure. Although I do have this one last air bubble that I really want to get rid of. So for those of you who have just joined us in the, the last few minutes here, uh, welcome to the amphitheater hot shop. Now, typically what we do in this space is we do furnace style glass blowing. We use these big ovens that you see behind us here and make things like bowls and vases, some of the objects you see on the, the front of the, the far side of the stage there. But uh, we also like to use this space to host artists from uh, out there in the world who may not live here in Corning, but may be renowned artists and give them a, an opportunity to show us how they, how they make their work. And so we are very fortunate today and tomorrow to have Yushin Goins joining us from Colorado. And uh, he has been here this whole past week. He was teaching a class at our teaching facility across the parking lot, the studio. And uh, now we've got him here today and tomorrow to make some of his work for our, our public audiences to see. And uh, so he's using a process known as flame working. And uh, for flame working, as you can see, we use a, a very focused heat source, typically a torch. And Yushin has been working on what is going to be a, a pendant all day. Uh, he started at 9 o'clock this morning. He's been working on the same object the whole time, making a very fine geometric pattern for uh, what ultimately will be a, a pendant. So he's applied all the color, and now he's starting to change the shape. And uh, he wants to change the shape of the form without changing the pattern and, and without that shifting around. So there'll be a, a phase of multiple stages of heating, inflating a little bit, and really slowly adjusting that shape, making sure that the pattern doesn't shift at all. And uh, I'll, I'll take a quick lap through the, the bleachers here. For those of you who haven't seen the, the finished object that he's shooting for, we'll show you how this pattern works. So I'm slowly right now melting this and uh, turning it into a uh, flat pattern rather than a cylindrical pattern like it was while I was drawing it. And I just go really slow. I melt it a little bit, I puff out a little bit, melt it a little, puff out a little bit until I get this flat. This is about to become flat here. This is the best part. As we get to have, have a little glimpse of the pattern I've been drawing all day, first time. 
we'll see if it came out good. If not, I'm going to put it in that water bucket. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't ever put my stuff in the water bucket unless it's uh, just completely toast. Always spinning both directions to keep from twisting my pattern. Now I'm going to dip this pattern into the tube a little bit. I'm focusing the heat on the center. And it's going to go in just a little bit. Holding the tube downward so gravity makes it fall in just a little bit. And then I'm going to do the teeniest suck inward. That kind of dips it in a little farther. We get a lot of guests here at the museum who uh, are under this impression that if you inhale as a glass blower, there's been sort of this long standing myth that you would burn up your lungs. Well, not true. All that hot air doesn't come all the way back through, and sometimes we intentionally have to inhale to, to change a shape a, a specific way. All right, so next, I'm going to use this punty here that I had from earlier. I'll set that off to the side and keep this warm because they're very susceptible to cracking in this form. We're going to see how this pattern looks. I think it came out pretty even. But I'm basically going to pop a hole off the side here. Oh, I don't have any shears. Just realized that. There's probably some over there, huh? Small ones. Uh, these might work. I don't need them to be too good. But if you do have smaller, that would be good. Oh, we've got shears in every size imaginable. There we go. Found some? No, no shortage of tools around here. Ah, oh, perfect. Yep. Ooh, are these Carlos? Oh, these are the best. <laughs> Carla Donas are my favorite. I unfortunately left mine in Barcelona, but I'm going to pick them up. <laughs> they cut through glass like butter. Just like ch -ch. I heard that uh, they're going to be the last few sets of them at gas conference that uh, they're stopping making them. I, that's just a rumor, though. I don't know if that's true. Wow. I, I hadn't heard that yet, but I know I've spoken with the Roberto, and it is not easy uh, keeping a business afloat over on Murano, so. They are the finest shears out there. I mean, yeah. when you cut with these, it's just like, wow, really, really nice. Uh, people tend to be surprised when they see us just cutting through glass like it's a piece of paper, but it's all about temperature. If you get the glass the right temperature, it's soft enough that you can just snip right through there. There we go. The first glimpse of the pattern. Actually, this one came out great. I'm really, really happy with it. Usually in demo situations, stuff doesn't come out as good, but this is not the case with this one. This one's probably one of my better ones in a while. So all the questions didn't throw you off. <laughs> Keep it warm, though. 
So the reason I cut it and then flopped it open like that bec is because I don't want to punty to the back side. Um, the reason I don't punty to the back side where the color is is because a lot of times uh, you'll go to do that. And when you pull the punty off, it'll take some color with it. And uh, it can take the whole center of your design out, which would look really bad. So especially after you spent five hours drawing it. So I'm going to heat this up in the center, get my punty hot. I'm going to attach this as close as I can to the center. So I've been spending the whole week drawing these patterns, and uh, I feel like I'm really warmed up now. It, it almost does take a whole week of drawing these to where you really get the results that you want. So now I got to get this excess clear off. And lucky for me, I have these fantastic Carlo Dono shears here to cut it off with. Because normally, since I left my Carlos in Barcelona when I was visiting there in October, um, I haven't had them. But I'm going back there in, um, in March. So I'm hopefully going to pick up my tools. I had an unfortunate accident where a friend of mine was taking my stuff to the Airbnb. It was really late at night, and I had actually just broke my hand skateboarding. I couldn't carry my big box of tools, so he's like, I'm going to take this to the Airbnb for you, and he took it. Unfortunately, the cab driver was kind of rude and drove off before he could even get it out of the back. The whole case got drove off with. About a month later, um, my friend Augustina helped me put in a uh, missing bag report at the Barcelona Lost and Found, which they actually have that. It's pretty crazy. But a month later, they called her and said, we found the box. It was a big pelican with stickers all over it, so it was unmistakable, luckily for me. <laughs> they found it all, and all my tools are there. I'm going to go back there in March and pick them up, along with my Carlos. I really missed these. Got an extra set. Give you 500 bucks. <laughs> no, to, find, to find an extra, <laughs> we'll, maybe we'll no. trade you for the pendant. <laughs> <laughs> we have a different definition for I extra. Actually, I was using here. Jim Moore's. Uh, um, Nate, Nate had some Jim Moore's. He was my TA in the class, and uh, Nate Myers. And uh, they work really well. I'd say they're a very close second. Very, very close, but mm -hmm. these are still my favorite. Have you worked with cutting edge shears at all? Yeah, red, I didn't like how metal. they cut. Yeah. Not as much. Mm -hmm. I like these. It's something about the thin blades, how small and thin and dainty they are, but still so sharp, and yeah. they don't dull. Mm -hmm. The metal, I think, is it must be folded, or it, it's really hard steel. <laughs> all right, so it's been taking a long time to do this, but I'm going to heat it up the outer edge glass. Just got to get a little hotter of a flame. And the goal here is going to be to get all this glass hot and cut it all in like one go if I can. That's what I'd prefer to do. Cut it all off in one go. With these, I might be able to do it. Using a little bit of centrifugal force there. And now I'm going to go in and cut this. I'm cutting close to the color, but I'm not getting too close. Try not to heat the color very much. Couldn't get all the way around. Just a little bit too much glass there.
So I just wanted to put this in the garbage there. All right, so I got, got that cut off pretty good. Now I gotta clean up the edges. So got the pattern here, cut off pretty well. Pretty happy with this pattern, honestly. Um, it's a fire lapis color combo. Fire, lapis, and white. We've got red, yellow, orange. And the lapis really with the white, it's just one of my favorite combos. I love, I love the contrast of those two. So now I'm gonna go in with the uh, six mil rod. I'm just gonna peel off the outside layer very carefully. It's really easy to take too much when you do this, so you have to be really light. A lot of times nowadays I, uh, I'll cool this off and then take it into the cold shop and grind off all the clear on the lap wheel. It's a much better way to do this. It's a little cleaner, but for the sake of this demo, I'm gonna do it the, the hard way so we can get it done. Otherwise, we'd have to sit here and wait for this to cool and then take it in there. So some folks might be wondering why you're willing to use shears and do that sort of cutting, and now you don't want to use shears for this last little bit of uh, clear coming off of here. I have a sense as to why that would be. You want to explain that to the crowd? Why, uh, why you're now sort of peeling glass off rather than cutting through um, it? Yeah, because the shears, it's just a little harder for me to get, like, the size of these blades, it's hard for me to get in there and get that clear off without distorting the color. Because mm -hmm. uh, to get this clear hot enough to cut, I would have to heat into the color a little bit, and then I could distort my color, and distort all the pattern work that I spent hours drawing. So I'm just going to slowly peel away at it. It'll take a little bit, but not nearly as long as the, uh, the drawing process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you hold the disc in your hand and just kind of like almost bash at the edge, or do you have it on a punny and like drill it, you know what I mean, and spin against the lap wheel? Get that even I keep this 8 mil punny on here if I were going to take this to the cold shop, okay. and I would make sure it's sealed on really well, like a hard seal, and then I would go on the lap wheel like this and just grind it, and I'd be rotating it on the lap wheel right. as I'm grinding. All right, thank you. Yep. So it's real close here. Just got to go around one more time. Peel off a little bit more clear. Gets really sensitive here because you can you can peel too much and peel into the color. I'm going to leave the teeniest rim of of clear around the edge of this. Just a little rim of clear around the edge.
got to remember to reheat the whole cab in between pulling glass off the outside, or it'll just crack right in half, <laughs> which is really a, a bummer. It's happened to me quite a few times. And yeah, we don't want that. <laughs> Hasn't happened in a while, though. So I'm looking for a nice even rim of clear around the edge. It's real close. Probably just going to pull a couple little more bits off of here. I think that's good for pulling clear off. So we took it from where it was. I'll show a little shot of it on screen here so you can see a little better. But yeah, here we have it. Wait, I'm blocking it. There we go. And I still have to make a hollow vessel to put this into, so that's going to be the next step. It doesn't take too long. Um, I want to say maybe another 30 minutes, as long as it's OK for everyone to hang out you know, if they want to. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oops, yeah. I haven't even looked at the clock. I've been so enthralled here. Then it's this will be completely. Four o'clock right now. Have at it. Yeah, another 30 minutes, and it'll be a finished pendant. Perfect. This is a little different process than I did on this uh, other pendant that I have here that uh, Eric was passing around or showing everyone. On that, on that pendant there, I just, once I had it flat on the back of the tube, I would coil, I would pull down some color down to about four millimeters and then start from the center and coil a layer of color all the way around till it covered the whole back. And then I would take that and put a bale on it remove it from the tube, and then clean up the edges, cut the extra clear off, just like I just did. And then I would put a bale on it. Usually I use the uh, marble mold to even the edges. Might actually do that on this one. So to do that, I kind of heat up. Nice even rotation, even spin in the marble mold. That evens out the color on the edges. Marble molds are great for that. So now it's even a little more round. It looks like a pretty even layer of the uh, lapis color around the edge. Minimal air bubbles, maybe a couple. A couple ma maker's marks in there. So now I'm going to take this. And actually, the punty isn't quite on here good enough, so. First thing I'm going to do is make sure that this punty is melted in. Last thing I want is for this to pop off at any point, so. is on there really good now. 
this is on here good enough that I could cool this off, take it over to the lap wheel, and uh, grind off the excess clear if I wanted to. But uh, another reason for that is sometimes when you break the punty off, or if, if say if I bonked this against something and it popped off with the punty the way it was, it would probably break a chunk out and take some color with it, which would ruin my design. So I'm just trying to keep this design as intact as possible and as close to how it was when I drew it. That's a good one. Ooh, don't trip on that. <laughs> and he tripped over the electrical cord and broke everything. <laughs> How about you go over that part? There yep, we go. I'm going to walk right. here. <laughs> um, I didn't think about this, but I should have heated this up. Although I am kind of thinking I'm not going to use this because I want to go with a color that's more pure. So mm -hmm. um, this is a vac stack color. Um, I think I'm going to go with this color called Brose. It's a really nice mixture. It's like between rose and brown. It's, it's really a nice color. Mm -hmm. It's made by Glass Alchemy. It's, I think they added it to their permanent palette, so it's pretty available now. It's really bubble-free, really good optics to it. I'm just going to coil up about maybe not even a whole stick, like maybe half to three quarters of a stick for this. Oh, thanks. So I'm going to try to inspect the stick to see if it's clean, make sure it doesn't have any rocks in it or anything like that. And I'm going to do the old wipe off on the shirt technique. <laughs> clean it up a little bit. It's pretty clean any, anyhow. I have it right in the, in the package here, so it didn't get dirty. off the end here. There's something really gratifying about coiling up some color. It happens a lot faster than the technique I was just doing, too. Much, much faster. So I open this tube of 12 mil up a little bit. I'm just coiling this up. I'm kind of rotating the glass a little bit in my right hand. And I started around the edge of the tube, and I'm slowly just coiling this up, making it bigger as I go. So you're trying to create a, a tube of the color that you currently have a rod of. Yes, yes, on. exactly. This is probably one of the easier techniques to turn rod into tube. There's a lot of different ways you can do it, a lot of different ways. So this is the first time you've done this technique? Yep, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
does not usually go quite so smoothly or neatly for folks with less experience. <laughs> yeah, I've done a lot of coil pots. In a way, it's kind of like pottery, maybe. I think that this is a technique in pottery. Hmm. Where they coil up clay and then make a vessel. I'll answer this question from the internet for you. OK. <laughs> why, not, why not just use colored tube was the question. He didn't have this color in tubing form, so he had yep. to create his own tubing. So that's, uh, that's exactly what's happening here. I was going to use some uh, of this other color I have that was vac stacked. It's called Voodoo. But I think for this piece, I wanted the color to be a little more striking and pure. Mm -hmm. um, when you take these transparent colors like this and you vac stack them or lay them over clear or do anything like that, you lose some of the pureness of the color. And um, what I really want in this piece is I, I want the color to be as pure as possible so that it, um, it just blends right into everything else. So now I'm going to melt in all this coil here. I think I got about about three quarters of a stick. I think this is going to be enough. Sometimes the uh, Herbert Arnold torches get a little, s they make sound at certain points in the flame, like different, different flame sizes can make it kind of loud or quieter. Uh, it's still pretty quiet, even when the Arnold gets loud for an Arnold yeah, uh, compared yeah. to many other torches. That's pretty quiet. Yeah, Carlisle's <laughs> are much louder. Yeah. I'm going to melt this in here. And once I get this all into a nice bubble, I'm going to open it up on the end and then connect that pattern onto the end of this and then work it into a disk a disk shape. I don't want to make the disk too large. I think 2 inches maximum is what I'm going for here because I want it to be a wearable pendant. I mean, some people do like to be Flavor Flav, but <laughs> I'm trying to you know, be a little more conservative. not used to having this mic here. I keep knocking the handle on it. The other way that I could have made this tube with the rod is I could have could have gathered the rod up into a 
like 25 millimeter puck and then I could have pushed an indention into it with a tungsten pick and pushed it all the way in, all the way through it and then blew, uh, blow it out after that. But it takes a little bit longer and I, on a disc like this, a smaller disc, you don't really see the, the coil marks very much. I hope that's enough color. I think it is, but may have to add a little bit. Probably am just going to add just a little bit to this. Funny questions. <laughs> funny online questions. I bet there's some really one funny ones they couldn't uh, ask me. <laughs> So to add a little bit of color to this bubble here, I'm just going to actually just push it onto the end and blow it out off this bubble that's already here. I don't need a whole lot more, just, just a little bit more. Chill the glass right here on the edge and then blow out. That should be enough right there. Probably only another two inches of color. Didn't need too much more. I just have a mental picture of how large that disc is in my mind, and I'm kind of going off of that. I've gotten really good at making, you know, taking a mental picture of what I'm working on and not having to take it out of the kiln and look at it. But, uh, if you're unsure of that, just use calipers. It works really good. I still use calipers a lot.
All right, got that all blown out, and I think I have enough color now. This bubble needs to be the same diameter as the flip for me to add it to it. It could, this bubble could be a little smaller than the flip that I did. And then I just have to flare open a little wider than the bubble is, which is totally doable, but ideally, having the bubble the same size is, is what you want. Now, if I were in the hot shop, I would have had this done like in like one minute. <laughs> here I am sitting here making this bubble for the last 15, 20 minutes. Uh, if only we could just gather it and have it molten already. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've played around with Boro furnaces a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can get one. They run at 2350 about. And then you dip in there with your long tube of, say, 25 millimeter tubing or something like that. Mm -hmm. You can dip right in there. It's really hot when you open that thing up, ripping hot. Got to wear gloves and stuff. Uh, especially gathering from vertically right above the furnace. That will certainly cook you pretty good. So I just kind of held this in the flame and uh, while I was rotating and gently puffed a hole open. Got to be careful not to blow too hard or you'll blow uh, bubble trash. Bubble trash is where you just heat up a bubble really thin and blow it out until it just pops and then glitter goes everywhere and you're like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> but it's really bad for you, so you don't want to do that. As sparkly and beautiful as it might look. Uh, you can actually blow glass as thin as cellophane and, uh, yeah, <laughs> potentially breathe it in as it's floating through the air. We're not really looking for that. Uh, we, we do get that question every once in a while, too. People wonder if you can blow so hard that you actually pop the bubble. And, yeah, we do it intentionally sometimes. had that whistle going because uh, the hole was just the right size and the flame had just the right velocity that it was like a little flute in the flame hitting the, the edge of it. So I've got this uh, little tweezer jacks here, and I'm going to open this up. Now, in the hot shop, most people would, would go up, and they would hold the jacks underhand. With this small jacks, I have actually have to hold this straight and then go down, because I have more stability going down with my left hand. There's no weight in this, really, so it's a little bit different than hot shop jacks. So I'm still I'm thinking of that mental picture of how large in diameter my disk is in the kiln. 
and I'm going to open this to what I think it is. We'll see how close I get. Is there any wax? I think I'm in the right place, right? I could probably just come right over here. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no, no, this is great. Any wax is good wax when you need it, yeah. If they quote me on that, I'm going to probably shoot myself. So, <laughs> Eugene says, any wax is good wax. <laughs> Thanks. So I think I'm almost opened up big enough here. Just, I think, one more time of opening here. Nice even heat base and just one more. Should be good right there. I'm totally guessing, though. Might have to open it a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs> Don't trip on the cord. Good call. <laughs> I actually need a uh, Kevlar pad, but I don't have one. So it looks like I actually opened it a little too big, but it's not too hard for me to close this down a little. I'm just going to get some heat into this pattern. Close this guy down. Oh, that's perfect. Yep, that's all I need it for. Thank you, thank you. So I think that should be good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little smaller. Well, I think actually that was perfect because I wanted to touch the clear to touch the brose. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this together cold in the flame, or cold out of the flame, and then I'm going to connect it in the flame. Just kind of pushing together. It's not actually welded together, but by putting it in the flame and melting after I placed it cold, I can make it connect, and now it's connected. Then I'm going to heat up this whole edge, give it a little marv down, kind of connecting that. Kind of seals it on nice. I'm going to get it sealed on really nice, and then I'll take that punty off the end. So a little puff.
probably actually going to leave that punty on just for now because I have to shape the disc in the back part. Looks like I got a nice connection here. It's sealing on really good. Didn't catch any air bubbles, I don't think. But I'm really focusing the heat on this connection point because I don't want there to be any uh, acute angles or anything like that. And I'm spinning both directions so I don't twist up the pattern once again. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Now to make the disc. So I'm going to make this crisp edge here. How I go about doing that is I heat the transparent color, the, the brose, and I puff it out a little bit. And it thins the color out in that spot. And then I can go in and make a sharp angle there. So I want this to be a really nice squared off disc. So now I'm pushing together. I'll puff it one more time. I'm going to push together some more. And when I get it to a certain point here, I'm going to push it on the marver on the edge here to crisp up the edge. So we got one edge, now I'm going to do the other edge. I'm going to have to go back to the front and melt this a little bit just to get it extra crisped up. I thin the color out again. Oops, I knocked that out of the way a little bit. So I thin the color out a little bit, and now I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did on the uh, the front part. I'm just gonna repeat that. using my marver pad to make some some shaping here crisping up the edges going between the uh, outside edge and the top of the marver pad Almost there. One more uh, edge, edge of the disc marvering here, and it'll be ready to melt the front. And then I'm gonna pop two holes, and this thing will be done almost. Just gotta tear the back off.
So I gotta be careful tearing this punty off. It's really easy to melt your design if you're not careful. So I'm waiting for it to cool before I go back in on it. This brose is actually looking really pretty nice. Can't see it from where you guys are, but it's got a really nice glow, kind of like the way the light is going through it. Getting all that clear off. Got to let it cool a little bit more. I think I got the punty all the way off. Now I'm gonna melt the face flat. First, I gotta puff it out a little bit. Puffing this out is just gonna kind of even the thickness up a little bit. When I did that seal initially, it was a little bit, it's just a little bit thick there, and I don't want that to pop later or have any cracking issues. So, a little puff out and then melt it back in, it should be good. Right, got the pattern all the way flat. I'm using the paddle to just flatten it out the rest of the way. Just a teeniest puff on that on the out. Looks good. And now I'm going to pop the two little holes. Got to figure out where I want to pop them. So I'm using the light from the torch to give me a little bit more light. And is this just an aesthetic choice as to how you want the, the pattern to hang? Yeah. Yep, I'm going to choose this way.
I'm not going to pop this hole all the way. Just going to get it to about that point. Then I'm going to do the other one. Try to evenly space it so that it's the pattern hangs evenly. Got the other one open. I'm just going to kind of take a look at this and see if they're even, because I can make adjustments right now. It looks like I need to go over just a tad with one of them. So I'm going to do it with this one here. Really close though. I have like a couple reference points on the pattern. That I'm going off of. And instead of blowing these open, I'm actually going to pick them open. I want these holes to be big enough that uh, you can fit a chain through this, so I'm going to open them a little bit. you're breaking the internet. Hmm? Our, our YouTube and Facebook numbers are through the roof today. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you're popular out there on the internet. Who knew? <laughs> I've been posting a lot for sure. For a long time. <laughs> there. Just trying to make these holes as even as possible. Had to remove a little bit of excess material there.
right, the holes are done. So now I gotta do the last step, which is put a punty to the center of my beautiful pattern, a cold seal. I know, I'm da living dangerously here. Yeah. I could do a hot seal if I wanted to. So I'm gonna get it nice and warm in the center to where I get a glow, basically. This is how I go about cold seals. So I got a glow there. As that glow goes away, I'm gonna connect this punty. But I wanna do a really small connection, like probably four mil connection. And glow is still there, so I'm gonna wait just a second longer. Heating the punty up, give it one last heat, and I'm gonna connect it. That should be good right there. It's not perfectly on center, but I don't need it to be on there for too long. Got to be really mindful of your punty because you can knock this right off of here and it'll have it on the floor. That won't be fun. Although I've had these discs survive drops. They're very sturdy for some reason, this shape. I'm gonna remove a little bit of excess glass from the back of this. I just want this to be flat, I don't want it to be a bubble in the back, so. Keeping a nice even rotation, I'm just gonna melt this until it goes flat. I'm holding it downward a little bit to help even the glass out. That should be it right there. I'm gonna give it a little paddling on the back just to crisp up that edge a little. One more melt. And it's slightly concave on the back. I, I kind of like that aesthetic. And that's gonna be it right there. I'm gonna heat up this paddle. Basically, boom. And then I'm gonna fire polish the uh, center. should be good. I could probably carry it to the kiln with these finishing tongs, but I'm gonna double up because I'm a little worried. There we go.